Good morning. This is the City Planning Commission public meeting held in Spectre Hall, 22 Reed Street. Today is Wednesday, July 12, 2017. As a courtesy during the proceedings, we ask that you please turn off all cell phones and beepers. All speakers should fill out a speaker's card at the desk outside of Spectre Hall. In addition, we ask that those providing testimony, please identify yourself, limit your remarks to three minutes, and speak clearly into the microphone. I will now call the roll. Chair Lago? Here. Vice Chairman Knuckles? Here. Commissioner Bessa? Here. Commissioner Cantor? Commissioner Cerullo? Here. Commissioner De La Here. Commissioner Dweck? Commissioner Edie? Here. Commissioner Efron? Here. Commissioner Knight? Commissioner Levin? Here. Commissioner Marin? Here. Commissioner Ortiz? Here. A quorum is present. The first item is the approval of the minutes of the regular meeting of Wednesday, June 21st, 2017, and special meeting of Monday, July 10th, 2017. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The minutes are approved. Scheduling. On calendar numbers 1 through 11, excluding number 4, and supplemental calendar number 1, we have resolutions for adoption. Scheduling Wednesday, July 26, 2017, for a public hearing to be held in Spectre Hall, 22 Reed Street. On the resolution, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? So the resolutions are adopted. The next part of the calendar is the report section on page 24. Borough of Manhattan, calendar number 12, CD4, N170317ZRM. In the matter of an application for a zoning text amendment concerning the Manhattan West Phase 3, Text Amendment. For a favorable report on calendar number 12, Chair Largo? Yes. Vice Chairman Knuckles? Yes. Commissioner Besser? Yes. Commissioner Cantor? Yes. Commissioner Cerullo? Excuse. Commissioner De La Uz? Yes. Commissioner Edie? Yes. Commissioner Efron? Yes. Commissioner Levin? Yes. Commissioner Marin? Yes. Commissioner Ortiz? Yes. A favorable report has been adopted on calendar number 12. Borough of Manhattan, calendar numbers 13 and 14. Calendar number 13, CD2, C170193, ZSM. Calendar number 14, C170193, ZSM. In the matter of applications for the grant of, a special, of special permits concerning 462 Broadway. For favorable reports on calendar numbers 13 and 14. Chair Largo. Before casting my yes vote, I just want to note the value of having a special permit mechanism as opposed to the other instances where we've seen large retail go forward without the special permit. And I would say most significantly, as one of the conditions of the special permit, is the requirement that there not be loading on Crosby Street between 8 p.m. and 7 a.m., which I believe um, responds to the concerns about the operations of some of the other um, large retail that have not applied for a special permit and so don't have these restrictions. And so I believe that with this condition, we are properly balancing the nature of Broadway, a truck route, as a major retail corridor while respecting the fact that the backside of the house, Crosby Street, has a very different character where we believe it would be inappropriate to have loading during the evening hours. And so with that, I vote yes. Vice Chairman Knuckles? Yes. Commissioner Bessa? Yes. Commissioner Cantor? Yes. Commissioner Cerullo? Yes. Commissioner De La Uz? Yes, and I appreciate um, the modification that was made with the dangerous that maybe shared concerns and the owner to be able to Commissioner Edie? Yes. Commissioner Efron? I thank the chair and Commissioner De La Uz for framing the context of this, and I vote yes. Commissioner Levin? Um, I, too, appreciate the chair's remarks. Um, I do agree that the findings for the good faith marketing permit have been met and that uh, retail is appropriate on the ground floor um, and seller at this location. Um, I do think that good faith should have included advising um, city planning staff and the commission that the applicant had undertaken a retail marketing effort after the conclusion of the good faith period and not leaving it for us to discover it on our own. Um, nonetheless, I do think the ground floor retail is appropriate here. I vote yes on that application, which is um, calendar uh, what, number 13. Um, that gives the retail potential at this location 
a total of 25,000 square feet, which is plenty big at this location. Um, I do think when it comes to the special permit for the large retail on the second and adding the second and third floors, that would bring this site to 45,000 square feet of retail if you count the cellar, which doesn't count for zoning. Um, one of the findings we have to make is that um, this uh, large retail will not have an adverse effect on residential use in the district. Um, uh, uses that zoning recognizes as an appropriate use of land in the district. We have allowed residential in this area. While I do think that the limitations um, that will be included in the special permit are certainly a step in the right direction, I just don't think it's good enough. I don't think there should be large retail here. I vote no on calendar item 14. 14. Thank you. Okay. Commissioner Marin? Yes. Commissioner Ortiz? Yes. Favorable reports have been adopted on calendar numbers 13 and 14. Borough of Brooklyn, calendar numbers 15 and 16. Calendar number 15, CD 16, C170189, ZMK. Calendar number 16, N170190, ZRK. In the matter of applications for zoning map and zoning text amendments concerning Ebenezer Plaza. For favorable reports on calendar numbers 15 and 16. Chair Largo? Yes. Vice Chairman Knuckles? Yes. Commissioner Besser? Yes. Commissioner Cantor? Commissioner Cerullo? Yes. Commissioner De La Uz? Yes. Commissioner Edie? Yes. Commissioner Efron? Yes. Commissioner Levin? Yes. Commissioner Marin? Yes. Commissioner Ortiz? Yes. Favorable reports have been adopted on calendar numbers 15 and 16. Borough of Staten Island, calendar number 17, CD2, N170191, CMR. In the matter of an application for the renewal of a previously approved authorization concerning 101 Circle Road. For adoption on calendar number 17, Chair Largo? Yes. Vice Chairman Knuckles? Yes. Commissioner Besser? Yes. Commissioner Cantor? Yes. Commissioner Cerullo? Yes. Commissioner De La Uz? Yes. Commissioner Edie? Yes. Commissioner Efron? Yes. Commissioner Levin? Yes. Commissioner Marin? Yes. Commissioner Ortiz? Yes. A favorable report has been adopted on calendar number 17. The next part of the calendar is a public hearing section on page 41. Borough of Manhattan, calendar number 18, CD4, N170389ZRM. A public hearing in the matter of an application for a zoning tax amendment concerning the special West Chelsea District tax amendment. If I could call uh, Salman Khan to make a presentation, I'll also note for the commissioners that Adam Ganser, of Friends of the High Line, and Michael Bradley of City Parks Department are available for questions as well. Morning. Uh, my name is Salman Khan. I'm here to present the uh, West Chelsea sub-areas D, E, and G tax amendment uh, on behalf of Friends of the High Line and NYC Parks. Uh, Friends of the High Line is the nonprofit conservancy that operates the High Line Park in partnership with the Department of Parks and Recreation. Uh, under the current West Chelsea zoning text, the area just west of 10th Avenue between 18th and 19th Streets uh, is one of several bonus sites that can purchase additional floor area uh, but must provide an easement to the city with a public stair uh, and elevator. Uh, the related companies are currently developing a new building on this site within sub-areas D, E, and G, uh, and they've already made their contribution of about $5.8 million into the Highline Improvement Fund and received about 116,000 uh, additional uh, square footage in bonus floor area. Uh, our application seeks to modify the zoning text uh, to allow the easement provided in this building to be used as a critical maintenance, op maintenance and operations facility uh, instead of a stair and elevator. Uh, there is a public uh, stair located uh, one block to the north as well as one block to the south, and there is currently a plan to uh, build an elevator one block to the south at 18th Street, uh, and the nearest elevator to the north is at 23rd Street. Uh, about, uh, apologies, um, more than half of the existing access points currently ha are ADA accessible, um, and that will continue to grow as we build this additional elevator at 18th Street. Uh, there are no permanent maintenance and operations facilities on the High Line north of the M&O building, which is currently at the southern end of the High Line. Uh, we have a couple of temporary uh, maintenance and storage facilities. There's one at 34th Street, which is a series of trailers that will be removed uh, once that site is built out. We have uh, some trailers uh, at 30th Street and 10th Avenue, 
uh, which will be removed at the end of this year when that site is built out. So the issue is uh, that we, or we're having is that heavy public visitorship on the High Line uh, makes going back and forth to Gansevoort Street extremely difficult, um, and it adds to the already uh, significant park congestion um, that, we're, that we're managing. Um, so this facility, would, which would be about 1,900 square feet, uh, would be located just east of the High Line uh, between, on the south side of 19th Street, uh, and it would support park operations by providing a storage space for horticulture, backup house space for public programs, events, field trips, um, and a maintenance workshop for operations. Uh, it would also provide a condition protected space for our staff to use uh, all year round. Currently, all staff has to come back to uh, the Gansport Street facility to use restrooms or facilities or um, uh, locker rooms all year round. So the size and location of this easement at the midpoint of the High Line, it's, it's at the one, one and a half mile long High Line, is critical and it offers us a unique opportunity to provide an operation space uh, permanently for our staff. Um, and it'll be essential to ensuring the continued excellence of High Line operations. Uh, as park visitorship continues to grow, this location will be a really critical permanent resource for us. Uh, the Community Board 4 and Barbara President have already indicated their support. Um, uh, thank you for your time. Does the um, facility in question, proposed facility, does it have to be constructed prior to related uh, starting its its project? No, it would be done in conjunction with the building construction. So in order for them to get a, a C of O, does that have to be done? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Arpa. Thank you. What is the timing of the 18th Street elevator and how certain is it that it will be built Specifically, is it more certain than the building or equally certain as it's, the building? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's certain that it would be built. I think it's about uh, about a year, maybe. They're looking at uh, summer, summer of 2019. Summer of 19. Thank you. Who said that? <laughs> <laughs> Adam Ganser with Friends on Highline. Uh, so the, the, the biggest gap between elevators currently is between 30th Street and 23rd Street. This distance, which would be the, the next would be between 23rd and 18th, would be shorter than the distance between 23rd and 30th. And by uh, acceding to this request, effectively we have given the applicant the opportunity to exit directly from the building onto the High Line property. Uh, is that correct? Meaning... Friends of the uh, NYC Park staff would be able to exit onto no, the highlight. No, 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 no. The, uh, there could be a lobby exit from the apartment house. Oh, oh no, no. This is a separate facility. The apartment house is separate from the island. Yes. We have instances where lobbies have allowed exit from the no. apartment house to the highlight, have we not? No, there's no, there's currently no, no access from a private building onto the highlight. There was one constructed at 16th Street, but it does not, it's not active. Nobody can exit. There's no private access point onto the, onto the park. Physical ability, you're saying there's no private access because it's closed off or because it wasn't built? Yeah, there is a door that was constructed, but it has never been used, and there is no access from that build, privately from that building onto the highlight. Is that the only building that has existing access to the site that is not being used? There's a building at 16th Street that has provided a public access point. It's not part of the, it's not, you know, a private access point from the building, it's but, not a private access point. yeah. Okay, thank you. Commissioner <clears throat> um, I have a question from the history books. I'm sorry. Um, I have a question from the history books. Back in 2012, we approved um, a series of actions related to Chelsea Market's plans to build on top, and there was some uh, 3,000 square feet of support space that they're required to provide once they do get that project underway. What's the status of that support space for you, and will this action change the need for that space? The, 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 there, we don't know what the timeline for them is. Um, this wouldn't change that. I believe the, 
uh, that space would be used uh, for uh, public restrooms and it would be a more programmatic space, um, whereas this would be primarily for back of house space for Friends of Italian staff. Um, we don't know the timeline of that yet, but it, it wouldn't change what we would use, uh, what we would ultimately need and what we would use this okay. for. Okay, that's good to know, because I think at the time um, when we were considering that space, there were also these needs yeah. that were going to be addressed there, um, right. but having um, achieve the commitment for that space for Friends of the High Line. I think it's important that we not get confused with this action, that somehow that's changing the commitments that were made for 2012. So it's good to know you'll be able to make full use of both spaces. I do want to point out this application is uh, Friends of the High Line and NYC Parks. Thank you. Commissioner Dutton. So just kind of following up um, to Commissioner Levin's question, so are there Besides the Chelsea market space, whose timeline is unclear, and this space, are there anticipated future needs for other back of the house type spaces um, that is, are being anticipated? Uh, I mean, we will, this won't resolve all of our operations issues, obviously. Um, there isn't another, I think this space is unique in that it's coming online soon and it's within the midpoint of the park. <laughs> um, we don't have another plan for a, another space that would come up that we could use. But if, if separate from what the future development may be, what would be an ideal? I friends of the High Line thought about what an ideal location for such a space would be. Um, I think the southern end, which we have, and the northern end would also be ideal, um, and then obviously the midpoint as well. But it, we would need a, another substantial space, and um, the ends are ideal just given the way the park operates. If, and if I may, yeah. I, I'm just curious. So. Talk, can you talk a little bit, or can someone perhaps who's following you speak a little bit about the ownership of the space and how that will work and how that's treated from a tax purpose? Mm -hmm. The ownership of the, of the Eastman space? space yeah. Of uh, the 19th Street space. Yeah. Um, so uh, it would be owned or it would be owned by the uh, New York City Parks Department, and it would be managed and operated by Friends of the High Line. Um, it would be constructed by the related companies, and we would be responsible for uh, we, meaning Friends of the Highline and Parks, would be responsible for the inside of it, and the uh, structural elements, the outside, would be respons the responsibility of related companies. And do you know how it would be treated for tax purposes? Uh, I do not know, but I could, I could find out. Other questions or comments? Thank you. Thank you. So those are all of the I'm registered speakers. Those are all of the registered speakers, but if there's anyone else who would want to be heard, Bar of Manhattan, Calendar Number 19, CD 11, C170066, PCM. A public hearing in the matter of an application for the for the site selection and acquisition of property concerning the NYPD 107th Street Parking Facility. Good morning, Chair Lago. Thank you. Yes, it is Lazarson, Vice Chair Knuckles, Commissioners. Uh, for the record, I am Dale Lazarson with DCAS, uh, the Real Estate Services Department. I am here on behalf of the New York City Police Department, and following me is Sergeant Chris Oliva, distinguished member of the department, to speak about NYPD operations. Um, we are here in favor of the ULERP application in front of you. This is for the acquisition of garage space. Uh, to be located on East 107th Street within a two-story parking structure that is part of the proposed forthcoming new mixed-use uh, development known as Lexington Gardens 2, for which I'm certain that you're familiar, Thank you. and for which uh, Edwin Marshall on Monday did a great job of illustrating um, the description of that project. The um, the garage entrance, as I mentioned, um, Lexington Gardens 2 will have um, some mixed use, residential, some commercial and some community space, and this garage for NYPD's use. Um, the project Lex Lexington 2 Gardens will have its primary entrance on Park Avenue. However, for this garage, uh, the entrance will be on East 107th Street. The garage is to um, support, it's used in connection with, and to support the NYPD's existing office operations, which are located right across the street as shown in that little white block, an office building, which also has some parking. Um, 
And again, NYPD, uh, Chris Oliva is here to speak a little more about those operations. Uh, for the duration of the, NYPD is currently on this lot um, and they will be relocating if they haven't already to a temporary lot for the duration of the project's development and then they'll swing back into this uh, new development. Um, we are proposing to acquire the space under a long-term structure with the developers, uh, which is being worked out right now in terms of the actual structure, a lease or a sublease, depending upon uh, the condominium structure of the building. Uh, and there will be opportunities to extend. Um, it is a condominium structure, so we are also in dialogue about the right to uh, purchase equity interest in the condo. Um, that itself is being worked out as well. May I answer any questions for you? Actually, I would. Um, yes, Commissioner. Commissioner Hepple. Well, to that point, uh, Ms. Lazarus said, I think you're responding perhaps to uh, the question I said uh, on Monday. Uh, yes. Being worked out, as in being pursued? Yes, it's being pursued. We requested the right when we initially started dialogue about this. However, um, due to some financing structures, at the time in 2016, it was not available to us. But as a result of the change in the census track and some financing matters, um, the developer is now uh, more agreeable uh, to this dialogue. So in fact, we'll be having that dialogue in the next couple of weeks, yeah. Thank you. Other questions? Thank you, Ms. Lazarus. Thank you. And if I could now call up uh, Sergeant Oliva. Good morning, Chair. Vice Chair, Commissioners. I'm Chris Oliva, Sergeant of the NYPD Facilities Management Division. The NYPD has been using 32 parking spaces in the city owned lot located at 127 East 107th Street since 2004. Our office was notified in early 2016 that the lot was going to be developed for affordable housing. We've been working with HPD and DCAS on plans to reoccupy the facility in a new indoor garage once the development is complete. The current parking lot is located directly across from a leased building located at 104 East 107th Street. This building houses multiple NYPD special units on the second, third, and fourth floors. The following units occupy the building. We have Manhattan North Traffic Enforcement on the second floor. We have the Firearms Suppression Division on the third floor. We have Emergency Services Unit Weapons of Mass Destruction on the third floor. Central Robbery Division on the fourth floor, and our Intelligence Division on the fourth floor also. Again, if this ULERP application is approved, the NYPD's intent is to continue to occupy the site in a new indoor garage in the new development. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Questions from the commissioners? Yes, Commissioner Levin. Um, I just can't resist asking, is there a, a, a public explanation of uh, um, what the Weapons of Mass Destruction Unit yes. does? Um, it sounds a lot scarier than it is. It sounds really, yes. really uh, scary. We respond so. to any type of um, <laughs> call in, involving chemical, nuclear, biological, or radiological threats. So you remember the scare a few years ago with the white powder? This is the unit that would go oh, there. Oh, the anthrax the Yeah, scare. anthrax, white powder, any kind of suspicious activity. Um, they are also members of Emergency Services Unit, so they also are like the do all of the department. They also respond if there's accidents, if there's, you know, um, on, on the bridges, if there's a jumper. So they, they do hmm. dual duty. But these are the specialized unit that just handles that. So they have a lot of equipment. That's why they needed to be park these vehicles inside. Got it. Uh, the trucks have a lot of uh, equipment on them, and they have a lot of specialized equipment like um, radiological suits and radiation detectors, expensive equipment. Okay. Great. Thank you. Other questions? If not, I know I speak for all of the commissioners in thanking you for your service and for taking the time today, Sergeant Oliva. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ahmed Tagani. Hi, good morning, uh, Chair Largo, commissioners. My name is Ahmed Tagani, Ass Assistant Director of Land Use and Planning and Development at the Office of the Manhattan Borough President. I'm here to testify on behalf of the Borough President in favor of the application by the NYPD and the Department of Citywide Administrative Services for the site location and acquisition of property located at 127 East 107th Street. After careful review, the borough president believes the site selection and acquisition of this property is a practical solution to addressing the needs of the city agencies and the development of this project. As stated in her September 16, 
2016 recommendation of a conditional approval for Lexington Gardens 2. This strategy allows the development of much needed affordable housing in East Harlem while also ensuring the NYPD would be able to maintain its fleet in nearly the same location. The new garage would remain in close proximity to existing NYPD offices, including the 23rd Precinct and Manhattan North Traffic Enforcement Unit. The proposed garage would also improve mobility and accessibility of the pedestrians along Park Avenue. Currently, the NYPD uh, uses a sidewalk for parking official vehicles because of need, creating an unsafe condition. However, the proposed garage will eliminate that need for parking on the sidewalk and create a safer experience for neighborhood residents along this section of the avenue. Acquisition of this garage will also provide a solution with predictable costs for warehousing municipal vehicles in the long term. This makes long-term financial sense given the alternative of leasing a private garage. Therefore, the borough president recommends approval of this application. Thank you for your time. Questions for Mr. Tregani? Thank you. If there is anyone else who would want to be heard on this item, please raise your hand now. If not, the public hearing is closed. Borough of Staten Island, calendar numbers 20 and 21. Calendar number 20, CDs 2 and 3, C1703373, ZMR. Calendar number 21, N1703740, ZRR. A public hearing in a matter of applications for the zoning text and zoning map amendments concerning the East Shore Special Coastal Risk District. I'll note that at our review session, the, our Staten Island office did a comprehensive presentation on this, so we thought not to redo the presentation today. Uh, we do have one speaker who has signed up in opposition, Dennis Delangelo. Good morning, uh, Good morning. Madam Chair, Vice Chair, members of the Commission. My name is Dennis Delangelo. I'm a lifelong resident of Staten Island. Uh, for the last 50 years, I've been involved in designing construction on Staten Island and in the other boroughs. The last 37 years, I've spent as a architect in private practice on Staten Island. Uh, majority of my practice is single family and two family detached residences. My main objection to this, and it's to item 21, uh, is the proposal that the restriction of development is going to go to single family detached. And it looks like it's on 9,500 square foot lots. And it looks like it's going to require coming to the commission. It looks like it's going to require you learn and state approvals. Uh, coming from Staten Island, and I'm sure the commissioners were aware of it, but attached townhomes, multi-story, multi-family residential is a third rail to local politicians, to community boards, and to most of my neighbors, and myself included. But asking individuals to make the most important investment of their lives and subject their families to an imminent risk is irresponsible does not protect the public health, safety, and welfare, and the cost of mortgages, loans, flood insurance will be overwhelming and may force abandonment of some of these homes that not too many folks would want to buy. The other side of this is that it may attract folks who may not live in the neighborhood. It's the ultimate gentrification, but someone who can afford a 9,500-square-foot, one-family detached home and afford the architectural fees, the lawyer fees, the city fees, and everything involved in getting these houses built, this is going to become another Manhattan Beach, possibly. But the storms are not going to respect any of this. Uh, in my opinion, uh, this is not a way to protect the citizens. In my opinion, there appear to be two options, my opinion. A complete buyout would allow the land to be restored, and a permanent natural protective buffer would be created, just like the state did in Oakwood Beach. It would protect upland properties, and it would also allow the city, who I assume would do the purchasing, to land bank this property. Uh, the process of long-term city planning, in my opinion, over the last 40 years of my life, has seemed to eluded the Department of City Planning. Uh, don't take offense, but I come from Staten Island. Uh, we're not a bunch of happy campers out there with zoning. <laughs> However, the second solution, which might be the preferred condition, is currently very controversial. 
that would be the tower in a park concept. High-rise concrete and steel structures could withstand whatever nature could throw at them. They could have schools built in, they could have stores built in, they would withstand it. More automobiles could be moved out to mall parking lots, but it seems that putting one family homes here makes no sense. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you, and if you would now um, entertain questions from Commissioner Efron. Thank you for, com for coming before us and for um, a very interesting point. I, I do wonder whether you have any idea how many of these lots, um, the 9,500 square foot lots, uh, possibly would be um, uh, available for ULURP action in your scenario of um, a large home going through ULURP. Well, large home or not, uh, the development of single family detached mm -hmm. uh, on the low end or the high end is putting individuals and their families in an awkward position. Now, the number of lots and developments, I've been down there after Sandy. We had a couple of jobs down there. It was my opinion at the time that if any government entity offered six or seven hundred thousand dollars to these people, they would have been out of there and the land would have been set aside for possible future uses that we may not be able to see now, 50 years down the road. But the houses that have not been damaged substantially have already been worked on, and they're not being raised because they didn't have substantial damage. That means they're still sitting there. The ones that were substantially damaged with the buyback, some of them are being raised at a great cost to the taxpayers, mm -hmm. almost millions of dollars each. Now, new construction, the houses are gone, is a different story, they're gonna to have to comply. But there's nothing to say that in the next event, you raise your house, you do what you're gonna do, you've got your mortgage, you've got your flood insurance, you've got your kids in school, you've got your car parked on Highland Boulevard, that somebody's 50-foot boat isn't gonna ram into your house, that the house next door that hasn't been raised isn't gonna float into your house, that your children aren't gonna be forced to leave. It makes no sense to put single family detached in these areas. It does make sense, in my opinion, if you're not gonna build something that can withstand this and protect the occupants, to just let it go back to nature. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Delangelo, for, for your testimony. What do you say to those, I guess this is a philosophical question, but just as there are those who returned uh, to this location after their homes were damaged. What do you say to those who um, would choose to live there? I mean, presumably there is a market uh, uh, for this area because aside from the inherent risk, it's a beautiful area in, in, in the minds of many people. So what do you say to those who say, freedom allows me to live where I want to live? Yes, uh, Vice Chair, I attended several of these charrettes that were held after Sandy. I'm a member of the Staten Island AIA. There were several civic groups uh, that got funding to go out and buy crayons and, and magic markers and yellow trace paper, and we had the community in, and these questions came up. And obviously, there is a group that has lived there. I mean, he started off as bungalows. They didn't have heat. They didn't have insulation. They were summer homes. Uh, over the years, they've been developed into permanent homes. Now, the people that were living there, uh, there was some who had the attitude that I'm going to be the last one out. I'm going to hold out because they saw what happened to Barclay Center. They saw what happens in other areas. But the consensus of government is to protect people. You know, people may want to live where they, their parents gave them their house, where they've been living. A lot of them moved out. You saw that in, in New York. In, uh, Oakwood Beach. I had several buildings down there with, with people that I knew as clients, invested hundreds of thousands of dollars in their homes, but they realized what they were up against. And this flooding and the fact that it's going to be chronic, it seems, uh, they took the bite and they moved their lives. They moved on. Uh, there's no reason why the city can't work something out if it does get to the point of building Sheepshead Bay or Coney Island or, or Long Beach along the coast, which is not in the cards now. But if this land is set aside, there's no reason why long range planning 50 or 60 years from now, the people that lived in Coney Island and Rockaways 50 years ago didn't envision those buildings along their coastline. But they're there. Somebody thought they were something of value. 
And there's no reason why these people can't be given a voucher or can come back and they can have their outdoor pool, their, their backyard barbecue on the 14th floor of a building that can stand anything that comes at it. I mean, I understand rights, but then we can take property away from people to build a mall. We can take property away from people to build a Barclay Center. We can take property anytime we feel that somebody's going to make a buck on it. If we're giving it back to nature, we can't take away their freedom. I don't see it being freedom being put into a flood zone and calling it a risk. How are these, has anyone talked to a real estate agent? It's like saying, well, move to the South Shore. It has the highest uh, auto theft in the, in, the, in the city. They don't tell you that. Here you're telling them it's a risk. These people are going to be paying through the nose for insurance for the rest of their lives. They're not going to be safe. They're not going to be able to figure out what's going to happen next year, make an investment, putting in a pool, building in a garage. It makes no sense to make it single family. It, it's not right. And the people that could afford this, it's going to be harder for the city in the future if there's few and far between, and you've got to pay $5 million for each of these plots. Got gotcha. you. Thank you. Thank you for your civic involvement and for taking the time today. Much appreciated. Good luck. Is there anyone else here who would want to be heard on this item? The public hearing is closed. Borough of the Bronx, calendar number 22, CD 11, N170 440 BDX. A public hearing in the matter of an application concerning the formation of the Morris Park Business Improvement District. Our first speaker is Michael Blaze Backer. Good morning. Ready? Um, good morning, Chair Lago and Commissioners. I'm Michael Blaze Backer, Deputy Commissioner for Neighborhood Development at the Department of Small Business Services. I'm joined by Jennifer Kitson, Director of our BID Program, Lamel Lindsay, Senior Program Manager, and Michael Malamed, somewhere in the room. Um, we're here to testify in support of the establishment of the Morris Park Business Improvement District in the Bronx. The proposed Morris Park bid is approximately 300 businesses, majority of which are small businesses along Morris Park Avenue corridor, which will be serviced by the bid. At SBS, we are working hard to open doors for New Yorkers across the five boroughs, focusing on creating stronger businesses, connecting New Yorkers to good jobs, and fostering thriving neighborhoods. We believe that, that the vitality of the city's commercial corridors is a key part of achieving this goal, and bids have been valuable and proven partners in small business support, neighborhood revitalization, and economic development across the five boroughs. In addition to our role overseeing and supporting the city's existing network of 74 bids, SBS also supervises the bid formation and expansion process serving as an advisor and resource for communities interested in developing or expanding bids. We are careful to ensure that each steering committee we work with adheres to our planning process and policies, solicits robust community input, and performs extensive outreach to collect and demonstrate <coughs> broad-based support across all stakeholder groups. Moreover, we are cognizant of the unique nature of each community we assist and aim to empower local stakeholders to make determinations on the proposed services, on boundaries, and the budget size that best suit the community's needs, appetite, and ability to pay assessments. While we always impart strong planning principles and share our data and best practices from across the bid network when working with any bid formation and expansion effort, we recognize the power and effectiveness of bids rests in their unmatched understanding of local needs and issues. The Morris Park bid formation effort originated out of a steering committee of community stakeholders, including 11 property owners, 10 commercial tenants, and two residents. The group held numerous meetings and consultations with local stakeholders throughout the planning and outreach phases. After an extensive outreach by the steering committee, SBS determined that the documented support among all stakeholder groups, including more than 50% of the area's total assessed value uh, signing in favor, was sufficient to support the application to city planning. Levels of support and response rates for the proposed Morris Park bid are in line with other recent bid formation efforts approved by the Commission and City Council. The proposed Morris Park bid, which would be the 10th bid in the Bronx, has met SBS's prerequisites for bid formation and we believe that the bid will improve business conditions and quality of life in the area. Therefore, SBS supports the establishment of the Morris Park bid. At this time, I'm happy to take any questions. Questions from commissioners? Commissioner Levin. Um, yeah, I, I have a question. Um, I mean, it appears that most of the retail along this stretch, uh, most of the properties are smaller businesses maybe what we call mom and pops, um, and that the average bid fee will be $2,400 a year. Is that, can these businesses support that? Are these the kinds of businesses that are able to reach into their pockets for those kinds of amounts? 
given, I, I'm going to to a large extent defer that to um, okay. the next speaker and the steering committee because I think that is sort of really what they take into account. It right. is true they're mom and pop businesses, but and you know average and, and sort of median payments can can be tricky depending on sort of the nature of there being corner properties and being multi-story buildings that have. Uh, you know, different ways of assessing. So there are sort of additional assessments for corners and, and uh, second story retail. So, but I think, yeah, I would best defer it. I mean, really the rate, right, the range can be substantial sometimes. So I think um, given the nature of those businesses and the familiarity with it, I'll defer to the next okay. two speakers. Thank you. Other questions, Commissioner Ortiz. Hi, how are you? Good. Um, I, question I asked during a review session, um, you know, we noted that uh, $95,000 of the $390,000 budget is for administrative uh, costs, basically. An executive director, community liaison, clerical work, bookkeeping, and special staff. Um, you know, with your experience with other bids, particularly smaller bids, as this one will be, um, is that sufficient to support that level of staff? And, and a follow-up question, you know, are some admin costs embedded uh, within the other categories? So yes, to the second part, essentially. So the way, obviously, the bid district plan, the way the budget is written is, is obviously sort of programmatic in nature. It's not a line item budget. So the administrative bucket includes certain OTPS overhead costs, as well as the administrative portion of an executive director or other staff salaries. But there are also staff salaries built into the other programmatic buckets. And that's a best practice we sort of encourage across the bid. OK. So essentially, the what will be going towards staff is more than 95, but it's embedded in these other Correct. Categories. Okay. Correct. And we, you know, and as, as, I mean, I think especially in small bids, I think we want to be mindful that, right, sanitation and, and beautification and a lot of these essential and marketing needs in particular, I mean, they're staff intensive activities. And so therefore, even you know, when passing the budget, when communicating to stakeholders, it's important that sort of built into that sort of programmatic bucket and not just considered sort of administrative overhead. Yeah, absolutely. I think staff really make the difference here. And one, another follow-up question? Um, you know, I noted that there are um, some medical uh, campuses in the area who obviously would have an interest here. I know in other bids we've asked the question, um, you know, to what degree, and, and this may be not be for you, but perhaps for follow-up speakers, you know, have those um, institutions been engaged in these conversations? And um, is there any uh, potential for uh, contributions in the form of uh, pilots, you know, payments in, in lieu of taxes um, that could be forecasted in the future that might help make this budget a little bit more robust? Um, I would say uh, at this stage of the process and the bid formation, um, you know, process leading before bid even exists. Typically, I think those conversations would really only happen with a nonprofit institution that falls within the boundaries of the bid, because that's where that you know that's sort of a natural conversation to happen. I think in this case, where the health institutions are you know well to the east of the uh, of the exact boundaries, I think you know a, a bid board would be in sort of have more leverage and and be better poised to have that conversation going forward. Uh, because I think that's where you know the bid will have, will be in place, have staff in place, and will be in a position to actually you know offer some value and be able to talk about what they could you know work, how they could work with an institution. But I don't think um, you know that's something where that sort of could be built into sort of the uh, sort of the thinking around sort of the assessment because it typically would be uh, you know, more of a collaboration. Um, I'm not sure. I mean, the, the universities I know in particular that contribute again are generally it's because they own. Um, and health institutions, they own property within the bids boundaries. Other questions? Thank you. Yes. Our next speaker is John Benicio. Good morning, Chair Lago, members of the commission. My name is John Benicio. I have the honor of serving as the chairman of the Westchester Square Business Improvement District. We are also um, an entity who is supporting the Morris Park bid uh, development project uh, in a number of different ways, which I would like to relate to you. Uh, the Morris Park Bid Steering Committee was formed in 2013 
on the coattails of this, this successful bid development effort undertaken in its neighbor, Westchester Square. The sponsoring organization was the Morris Park Alliance, a volunteer merchant association that gathered a group of 31 commercial property owners, commercial tenants, area residents, and community leaders to begin the development process. Supported from Council Member James Vaca and a grant by his organization, the Bronx Chamber of Commerce was enlisted to assist in organization and outreach efforts. The passage of time witnessed the disbanding of the alliance when its leaders retired, moved away, or fell victim to the demands of business. In a turn of events that speaks loudly of the dedication of the area's stakeholders, the Morris Park Community Association, a 40-year-old resident organization, assumed the role of sponsor. The chamber was succeeded by NIDC, the Neighborhood Initiatives Development Corporation, and in March of 2016, our organization, the Westchester Square Bid, was brought in to restart outreach efforts and wrap up the loose ends of the project. During the chamber's tenure, a survey of commercial property owners, merchants, residents, and consumers was undertaken to assess area needs. The results of the survey uncovered a strong need for a business plan for the business district, the engagement of a paid ombudsman to guide area advocacy, the establishment and promotion of a strong district image, an increase in consumer foot traffic, graffiti cleanup and enhanced sanitation services, and the maintenance of a safe community. Based on the survey, a plan was established that includes a full-time executive director to oversee programs and services that include sanitation services, a comprehensive marketing plan, a streetscape program and branding initiative, and collaboration with the support of the existing civilian safety patrol run by the community association. A budget of $390,000 was adopted to provide these services. The committee also plans to undertake additional economic development efforts once the bid is established with funding and resources from local anchors just outside the bid district and by taking advantage <clears throat> excuse me, of grant programs available in the community. The committee considered several formulas for the equitable establishment of assessment fees to pay for the plan. These included formulas based on assessment property value, square footage, front footage, building structure, etc., and combinations of these factors. Based on the low density environment of the district, a front footage formula was adopted for commercial and mixed use properties of approximately $41.66 per year per front foot with an additional $300 per year for corner properties and $300 per year for properties with commercial uses above the first floor. Um, if I can have another 30 seconds. I think we can give another 30 seconds. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I'd like to talk about support. Outreach for this effort was extensive and included execution of multiple mailings to all the stakeholders, presentations at community board meetings, community association meetings and merchant gatherings, and in hundreds of one-on-one -on -one conversations with home, business, and commercial property owners. In addition, two public hearings were held in the district so stakeholders could question board members and employees of other established bids, employees of the Department of Small Business Services, and local elected officials. Statements of support were collected by the outreach team to document support with the following results. 53% of the area stakeholders voted. More than 52%, I'm sorry, 59% of the area stakeholders voted. More than 52% of all stakeholders voted in favor of establishment of the bid. 92% of responding commercial property owners voted in favor. 99% of responding commercial tenants voted in favor. 100% of responding residential property owners voted in favor. And 100% of all exempt property owners voted in favor. I therefore ask you to please approve this bid. It's very needed in the community. Thank you for your service, both at the, um, your original bid and also for your support for setting this one up. It's my honor. Questions? Yes, Commissioner Efron. I don't know the bid rules well enough to know if this is a silly question, but I will ask it anyway. No um, silly will there, thank you, will there be shared services between the two bids? Uh, not at this time. There's no plan for that. One of the, um, you're asking me personally, or is this part of the plan? Because if you're asking me personally, I could tell you what my, my druthers would be 10 years down the road. But for now, no. Thank you. I think we can probably read your mind. Other questions? Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is William Padone.
Good morning, everyone. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chair. Um, my name is William Fidelin. I am the Morris Park Bid Business Improvement District Steering Committee <coughs> Chairman. First, I'd like to say thank you to uh, Mr. Fenizio. Um, his office, as well as uh, the Small Business Services, has been instrumental in helping us move this forward insofar as uh, uh, becoming a bid. Uh, we're very uh, proud of the work that we've done. Um, I started back with the Morris Park Alliance. Uh, as a business owner in the area, I own a local True Value hardware store on Morris Park Avenue and have, my family has been there for many years. Um, we're very proud to be steerhe steerheading and, and moving forward with this. If anybody understands the history of Morris Park Avenue, um, it goes all the way back to the horse-drawn horse carriages of Mr. John Morris. Mr. John Morris thought it best to build a racetrack out of some farmland. Mr. Morris would drive up to the country, being the Bronx, which is most of the country then, um, and start to develop a plan to build a racetrack. He then uh, incorporated a lot of immigrant workers, brought them uh, to the United States, a majority of them being Italian Masons, who then settled in the area that I currently, uh, that, that I currently reside in with my business. Uh, Morris Park Avenue uh, was the old Main Street at that time. So a lot of people came and uh, they built up the area. After building a racetrack, of course, uh, you know, as being the, we moved forward to uh, the planning of the Bronx. You know, we, we've seen the maps of old um, and all the utilities and things like that. So just envision back in the 30s and 40s, cobblestone streets, cable cars that my grandmother used to take my, uh, my uncle and his four brothers, including my father, um, to shop locally in the area. Then you move forward into the future. Um, you know, we're looking at box stores. We're looking at a lot of competition. We're looking to give them competition. We look at the, 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 uh, the uh, proliferation of large shopping malls. We look at the, uh, you know, the category killers, the boxes. We look at uh, internet and online sales. We look at all of these things. We say, how are we, as a, uh, as a neighborhood, as a business, as well as how, we, how are we as business owners and employers, going to cater to our local community. And we feel that the best way to do it is through the bid, uh, through a business improvement district. So, you know, in essence, uh, what is our merchant's future? And I believe that it resides within a business improvement district. Any questions? Thank you for giving us the historical perspective and the current oh. reality. Yeah, there is, yeah. There is uh, <laughs> quite a track all the way through. So it's, uh, it goes way back to horse-drawn carriages and farmland. I still have some of the old sickles in our hardware store. I've got a lot of the antiques from the 1800s. Uh, my building was built in 1894. Um, when they do construction in the streets, I make sure that I'm street side to gather some cobblestone. <laughs> I have old black and whites in my hardware store. Okay. Old black and whites are those cable cars that my father and all of my family remind me of because they grew up around the street. I'm third generation, uh, maybe even fourth. But uh, I'm third generation from the Bronx. Um, born at Westchester Square Hospital. Um, we have uh, occupied that area for more than 110 years. So there's, there's quite a lineage. And I, I look forward to advancing that. And uh, yeah, that's our legacy. I mean, what do we leave behind? What is our legacy? Where do we leave it? Where do we make a stand? And we have a lot of competition. There's a lot of things. You know, we would like to build a neighborhood. Our neighborhood is 30, 3565, owner occupied, renter occupied. I'd like to see that balance changed over time, to bring people back into the neighborhood, to beautify their homes, to build the area. Commissioner Arfan. I just wanted to make a comment besides thank you for coming and speaking about the history. Um, uh, this past weekend, I spoke to somebody who buys homes outside of New York and invests in them, fixes them up, and then uh, rents them out. And he said he chose neighborhoods based on where there's a locally owned, full service hardware store in the town. So. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. And services are key. So, I mean, all of our businesses here throughout here are all, you know, a lot of them are service based businesses. Of course, we sell hard goods tangible goods. There are other people who do offer services. You know, we used to have a shoe, sh we have to, used to have, uh, you know, cobblers. We used to have, you know, plenty of butchers. We've had, you know, plenty of bakeries. Uh, we had ravioli producers. All of those businesses have gone away. So where do we go? What do we do? How do we bring it back? How do we build it? <coughs> yeah. Commissioner, please. Hi. Thank you. I, I know this is often an uphill battle, so congratulations for getting this Thank far you. and for, for putting all the work you've done in. Um, I, 
I have a question uh, for you. It's a, a little bit more of an existential question, but um, you know, New York State um, is one of the few states that doesn't require bids to go through reauthorization. Um, so once it's established, you're there. You know, yeah. there's there's no need to go back to right. your businesses to ask them how what kind of good job are we doing. You know, um, there's there's, you know, so oftentimes I think. We sometimes face the challenge, um, bids do after a few years of becoming a little complacent. Um, and I'm curious, since you're getting started, you know, this is a great opportunity to sort of think about that. Have you given some thought to how you plan to sort of communicate success or, you know, what, by what metrics you'll determine um, your success? So when you talk to someone who's making this $2,500 investment every year, they know they're getting their money's worth. Yeah. Has that conversation been had? Well, first of all, I am putting my money where my mouth is because I do own, I do own uh, you know several frontage properties. Um, so I, I, I appreciate what you're asking. Um, we're going to follow some of the examples of the uh, the recent bids, including the Fordham bid, uh, including Westchester Square. Uh, we will have, uh, of course, we'll have outreach meetings. Uh, we'll also have you know we have to designate a board once this uh, is approved. Uh, but there'll be, uh, you know, communications, I believe, uh, insofar as newsletters, the successes. Uh, you also see the success on the street. You know, uh, you know I'm hoping that uh, we can have an executive director uh, uh, who will interface with, uh, you know, transportation, you know, bus sheltering. Um, we have a corner that is a major thoroughfare, right at the corner of White Plains Road and Morris Park Avenue. You know, um, there's two sides with a bus, shed, bus shelter. The other two sides of the direction of Manhattan don't have bus shelters. You know, it's the little things that I think that'll mean a lot that'll add up over time. So I do believe that'll be visible. Uh, you know, we have an opportunity here to, uh, to dress up the neighborhood as well, uh, to clean it up. You know, we've gone around every year looking for uh, donations for holiday lights. You know, and you know, at this point in time, we won't have to with the bid. That will be worked in and so far as how we do it, what we do, you know, what we hang, how long we do it. Um, so there'll be a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, questions over time that'll be answered. But to answer your question about community outreach, uh, we look forward to using some of the examples from the Fordham Road bid, from the Westchester Square bid, and other bids around the area. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Thank you, Mr. Padone. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Have Those are all of the registered speakers. If there's anyone else who would be interested in speaking on this item, please raise your hand. Yes, sir, if you could come up and introduce yourself. Good morning. My name is Richard Bassick. I'm part of the bid development team working out of Westchester Square, and I also happen to be a resident of Morris Park. And I wanted to address a question that was asked earlier and was promised an answer that I did not hear, and that is, how can the average uh, property owner or merchant handle a $2,400 a year assessment? And, and I wanted to address that one uh, question because it's an important one. Um, as a resident of the area and as a patron of many of the businesses in the area, and as a bid uh, uh, you know, developer, uh, I've noticed that the average store front in Morris Park is probably only 22 or 23 feet wide, but the average lot is about 45 to 50 feet wide, containing two stores, so that the $2,400 a number that was presented earlier will be divided between no less than two stores. So that now we're talking about $1,200 a year, perhaps $25 a week for the merchant. And believe me, as a patron of many of those merchants, I've heard them say to me numerous times, $25 a week is a small fee to pay to invest in the growth of my business and to invest in the growth of my business community. So that's, I wanted that to be understood, that it's really about 25 bucks a week for the average merchant in Morris Park. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you so much. Questions for Mr. Bassick? No, thanks. You're Any others who would want to speak on this item? The public hearing is closed. Okay. Borough of the Bronx, calendar numbers 23, through 26. Calendar number 23, CD4, C170311ZMX. Calendar number 24, N170312ZRX. Calendar number 25, C170314, 
PPX, calendar number 26, C170315, ZSX. Public hearing in the matter of applications for zoning map and zoning text amendments for disposition of city-owned property and for the grant of a special permit concerning the lower Concourse North rezoning. Notice, a public hearing is being held by the City Planning Commission in conjunction with the above EULA parents to receive comments related to a draft environmental impact statement. This hearing is being held pursuant to the State Environmental Quality Review Act and the City Environmental Quality Review. We are going to have a 10-minute applicant team presentation by Cecilia Kushner with Ted Weinstein from HPD being available for questions as well. Good morning. Um, good morning, Shall I Go and members of the Z Planning Commission. My name is Cecilia Kushner. I'm a senior vice president in the development team at the Economic Development Corporation. I'm joined by Ted Weinstein, the director of the Bronx office at HPD. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to discuss the Lower Concourse North project. This project is a unique city opportunity to develop a large city-owned site that is vacant, that has tremendous potential to deliver affordable housing, new waterfront open space, and community amenities to the South Bronx. Um, I first like, would like to thank the Department of City Planning staff, and especially Carol Samuel, Sean Brady, and James Moralia for helping us um, prepare for, um, for today. Before I begin discussing the site, I wanted to provide a little bit of context on the extensive city work that EDC, in partnership with DOT and Parks, is doing in the area. The Lower Concourse North project is a key component uh, of the Lower Concourse Investment Plan, which is a $194 million infrastructure and open space investment that was announced by the mayor in the 2015 state of the city and which is currently being implemented by EDC. This significant investment builds upon the development framework that was established by city planning in 2009 through the Lower Concourse rezoning, whose primary goal were to transform 30 blocks of transit-rich Venning industrial waterfront area into a mixed-use, uh, vibrant community. As with many areas um, of the city that have a long industrial past, even when the zoning is right, large-scale city investment in infrastructure are necessary to make sure that pri private investment can actually take place. To guide and prioritize this $194 million allocation, EDC, in partnership with city agencies, conducted, conducted investigative analysis on the state of the existing infrastructure, and through interactive workshops and community visioning session, we work closely with CB1, CB4, and a community working group that was established by Speaker um, Melissa Mark Viverito. Through this engagement process, we identify four different community priorities. The first one is the development of mixed income affordable housing that meets both the needs of current um, uh, lower concourse residents as well as provide opportunity for moderate and middle income um, uh, housing in the area. The second really strong priority from the community engagement was a desire for more open space, including extending the Harlem um, River Waterfront Greenway and Safe Street Connection. The third priority was community facility uses that benefit the local community and includes activity for youth and cultural and educational space. And the last priority was access to jobs and workforce development. In response to this engagement and, and, and this effort, um, we've committed to a number of projects, including a full depth reconstruction of exterior streets with new sewers and waterline and a full redesign of three very large, complex and unsafe intersections at 149th Street, 144th Street, and 138th Street. We also in the process of acquiring um, uh, land uh, that was mapped parkland as part of the 2009 uh, DCP rezoning um, in order to build a new 2.3 um, waterfront park that would be at the end of 144th Street. Um, this, this, again, this land was mapped parkland in 2009, but the actual acquisition and, and building of the park was never funded by the city. So we're happy to be able to actually transform this into reality here. Um, we're also happy that we'll be able to develop significant open space on our site in Lower Concourse North, as well as making uh, infrastructure investment in broadband to try to spur the area as a jobs hub. All of these investments are in um, under various stages of, of advancement right now, but broadly, we aim to complete the street and the sewer infrastructure by 2020, and our goal is to secure title uh, on the acquisition of the properties for the mapped parkland in early next year and be able to open the park in 2022. The Lower Concourse North site is a critical investment as part of this overall vision for the area. Historically an industrial site, um, the only remaining freight building that was on the site was demolished in the early 2000s, 
And since then, the site has remained vacant with its waterfront in disrepair and activity only with temporary uses. And over time, many ideas for this site were discussed, but they were never funded, including using it as open space, indoor recreational uses, and even a velodrome during the 2012 uh, Olympic bid that the city went for. The Concourse North, which is something that's very important to us, is one of the very few remaining vacant city-owned parcel in the neighborhood. It's a very large site, and we believe it allows us to deliver on the multiple goals that were established for the community <coughs> process. So using this input and, and, and the opportunity that the sites represent, um, we, disc we created a reasonable risk-case development scenario that includes about half of the site as new open space accessible to the community, including an extension of Mill Pond Park um, that is an existing site to the north, a new waterfront esplanade and greenway, as well as a new public plaza near exterior street, up to 1,000 units of residential unit <coughs> for which the city is committed to maximize affordability along a range of income, and a significant commercial and community facility component. This unique development potential does not erase the fact that the site has significant planning challenges, including the proximity <coughs> of the Deegan, the existing Oak Point uh, rail link along the shoreline, potential remediation concerns, and limited circulation access for one street only, 150th Street. Moreover, the site would be the first waterfront development in the area since the 2009 rezoning. So to ensure that the market was concurring with the potential for the site and to send a strong signal to the community that we were committed to this project, we released an RFBI last summer and decided to move forward with ULU approvals in parallel. And our goal is to be able to select a team as soon as possible that can deliver on the broad set of established community and city priority and really catalyze development for this entire neighborhood. Uh, to make sure the site and the project produce the best possible design, we've worked really closely with our colleagues in the Bronx at the Zoning Division, Urban Design Division at City Planning to develop both design guidelines for the RFEI and to craft special zoning requirements as part of the new sub-district in the special Harlem River District. Our primary goals for these special zoning regulation were to activate ground floor and the base of the building with retail and commercial activity, place bulk in a way that is thoughtful, considering the complexity of the site, uh, the bridge, the shoreline, and create a seamless experience between the buildings and the various open spaces. We're committed to make sure that this project exemplifies the best possible design and meets its potentials as a catalyst for the area, and we look forward to continued collaboration with city planning on that. The additional land use actions in front of you include a rezoning from N21 to R72 with a C25 overlay, um, disposition authority and the mapping of MIH. We're also seeking a special permit to waive the requirement for parking spaces for a unit above 80% of AMI to support the affordability goals for the project, as well as in recognition of the transit access of the area and the existing large supply of parking spaces in the immediate vicinity. Since the mayoral um, announcement of investment for lower concourse, our goal has been to do very meaningful engagement with the community to ensure that the city's effort and the site deliver long-term priorities. As the project, this project, as well as the overall set of investment move towards implementation, we want to continue this dialogue and we've committed to form a dedicated working group to meet regularly with CP4, CP1, and all the stakeholders in the community to provide input and continue to address concerns. Uh, we're also committed and happy uh, that we will be able to hold the public design process for both the open space on our site and Lower Concourse North site, as well as the new <coughs> parkland at 144th Street. So just in closing, and uh, before we take questions, just want to say this project is a product of years of engagement, and we think it comes at a unique moment for the area where the city is both using its land to catalyze development as well as making significant investment to really see the potential of this very special neighborhood. Um, so we're really proud of this project and, and happy to take any questions. <laughs> questions for Ms. Kushner. Vice Chair Nichols. Uh, thank you, Cecilia. I, I think uh, it's really for the first time I now uh, realize that you're no longer at uh, city planning. <laughs> so, because uh, I see you here so frequently, I thought you were still here. So, congratulations. That's how it is. Thank you. Um, secondly, let me say, uh, of course, I was here in 2009, and I voted for the lower concourse uh, rezoning with uh, a lot of the expectations that you've just expressed. Um, and I do appreciate the uh, planning uh, that's gone into the conceptualization of this project. Uh, that said, though, I do want to reiterate uh, what I said at the um, 
review session, and I think you were here, that it is my concern that given uh, a project of this magnitude, a project that will likely um, amass over a million square feet of, of, of FAR uh, on this very significant site, um, that we, the commission, uh, should we vote in favor of this, uh, at this point would not see it again, and we would not have the opportunity to weigh in on uh, the finished product. And I, I have uh, real concerns about that. This is not to cast aspersions upon whoever is selected, uh, the integrity of that entity, and certainly not EDC. I, I just think um, certainly in the years that I've been on the commission, uh, projects of this magnitude, uh, once a zoning determination has been made and there's been a certification, we would always see the finished product. And uh, I just want to restate that that's a real concern of mine, despite what I think is a, um, uh, a positive set of aspirations. Sure. So I think what we've tried to do is really work closely with the Bronx office, the urban design and the zoning division to craft a zoning that allows for a very clear framework on what can happen on the site. So we have specific bulk and use requirement. Um, I just want to also state for the record that both our agency and city planning are in active dialogue to discuss um, how to deal with project and circumstances like this one and define an approach for design review. Uh, postula of approval, and so I, I believe um, I would believe there will be movement and, and a response on this. Commissioner Kent. Thank you. First, I'd like to say I uh, share the concerns of the parts. A job this size is very ripe in the requested, the requested changes as life, life goes on. Some of those changes will be valid, some will be invalid. Some of those changes are necessary, others are unnecessary, except to create a uh, better performance for the resident, for the contract, for the development, excuse me. And basically, as the vice chair has said, you're coming to us on a one-time visit, get it approved, sell it, and hope for the best. And that is a cause for concern. Have you? Uh, Considered? Have you planned? Have you thought about the future in terms of these requested modifications, which will inevitably come up? I've been in this business a long time. I don't think a job this size will be built from scratch to finish without requested variation. Um, so, the the project will have to come back in front of um, the department for a waterfront certification. That's mm -hmm. like. The project will have to come back in front of the department for a waterfront certification because we have zoning requirement here. There will be a PDC approval as part of it as well because we uh, we expect to do a grand lease for the disposition of the site. Um, and again, Can you what PDC is? oh sure, uh, the Public Design Commission mm -hmm. that will look at the entirety of the design uh, of the building from bulk and massing to the actual architecture and the quality of design, including open space. Um, I would say that our intention is to make sure that we had a, a, a good quality design framework for the development of the site, but at the same time, uh, we hope to not have a lot of subsequent action, but completely understand your point. It's a very complex site, very complex project, and so it, it's possible that be the case. And I just want again to reiterate that like, there, are, there are active conversation on these topics between our two agencies, and, and we think we'll be able to come up with an approach that satisfies the commission and make sure that we have quality design and predictable development at the same time. Commissioner I, I Since we're on this topic, <laughs> um, you know, I do, I do want to say I, I would like to acknowledge that um, you know, developing a strong framework and trying to um, establish that um, is, is really a best practice um, in economic development. Um, you know, I understand there's always a desire on the part of the commission to review things and have a final say, but you know, to the extent that we understand how expensive urban development can be and you know, layering on um, additional approvals and processes um, makes it even more expensive. Um, in an environment where we're trying to create affordable housing, 
um, and lower the amount of subsidy that we have to give to these projects. So um, you know, do want to say that, that I, I, I recognize the balance. Um, you know, my, my, my question, and, and it's related to this a little bit, the opportunity to come before us is also the opportunity for the public to weigh in. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I, I would like to know that um, what's happened to date um, has result, has come from uh, public engagement, um, you know, and, and the, to the degree you could speak to um, how this plan was developed um, with public engagement in mind, because I, you know, I do note that, you know, the community board um, has requested, um, you know, that there, for the other sites, for other city-owned sites, that there be a commitment to public engagement. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we have seen um, previous, uh, uh, very recently, um, previous approvals that have come before us where there have been a, a, there's, there have been a lot of complaints about, um, you know, Bay Truster uh, in particular, where, you know, the, the RFP went out and decisions were made without um, real input from the community. And then we had a, a moment where, uh, you know, there was a disconnect between <coughs> what was proposed and what it seemed the community wanted. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think that, for me, is more the concern yep. than the framework. You know, how are we going to ensure that we've incorporated public engagement so we don't need it again. That's right. So I think I think like our intention was always or, or what I'll say is like here we think we have a unique opportunity. We have substantial investment and we have a site. So our primary goal was to make sure um, on the outset with this entire planning effort that really goes from conception to implementation that we get the investments right. And so we've done extensive public engagement with folks locally uh, through workshops, public meetings, going to the community board to try to engage people and like what should the priorities for investment be. And I think like there is now a consensus on what the investment should be in the area, how the city should spend its dollars and its effort, and like what is the overall goal that we want to achieve in the Lower Concourse North project. And then we agree with you that the devil's in the detail, right? And like what makes the difference to a community is how we actually execute a project which is why we're committing to this working group. The goal for it is for us to be able to come regularly and being able to update people as to where we are on the implementation. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, thank you. Um, we're able to update people on the, the specifics of the implementations of different projects and being able to engage them on the actual design process that we're going through. So for example, like one very specific way in which we want to do that is the open space design for both the park um, that we're acquiring as well as the open space that will be on our site. Um, people have agreed that open space matters and access to the waterfront matters, but then there, there's going to be a need for a greater dialogue as to what that open space should look like, sh how it should be programmed, um, how do we make sure it's actually accessible and attractive. And so our commitment through the many years that we'll continue to spend dollars and move this project forward is to continue this dialogue with the community to get feedback in real time that can inform the many decisions we will need to um, be making. And that will be the case as well for the Lower Concourse North project. When we're able to um, select the team, uh, we certainly would want that team to come directly to this working group, be able to talk to them about the specifics of the programming of the building and get feedback in real time. I mean, I'd also I, note for Commissioner Ortiz that we have quite a number of speakers, both in favor and in opposition, so I think that will be an opportunity to bear and address maybe some yeah. of the concerns. And if I could just clarify, so then you're saying between the PDC and the advisory committee, those are the opportunities to sort of continue to shape this, even though you may not be coming before Commissioner. That's right. And then there will be a 384B4, <coughs> which is also the formal process, like when there will be a developer selected by which the community board, the borough board, are able to make, um, uh, to, uh, to, to give final um, input onto the programming as part of like the business deal. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Thank you. I, this does seem like a great opportunity to actually create a really strong pedestrian access site, given that there's an IBZ and there's an in, there will be an in-place mm -hmm. workforce, um, and that there's access, at least vehicular access um, across a bridge that, and there are two bridges where there might be pedestrian access. Has there been any thought to creating a real pedestrian plan so that it's really clear how pedestrians would meet 
the street level on yep. the wrong side and yep. cross to the other side and a lighting plan that's corresponding. Is that something we'll have a chance to see before this goes out? Um, yes, yeah, so first part of the question, yes, a, a significant part of the investment uh, of the $194 million is about redesigning exterior streets, which is the street that's um, basically under the major beacon here, as well as, could you take the microphone with you? Oh, sorry. Um, so this is exterior street here, and these are like three very large intersections. So right now, the main barrier in the neighborhood is just like the width of the Deegan, and the fact that these three really large intersections, this one that leads directly to our site and to the bridge, this one that will directly lead to the new park, as well as 138th Street, which is right outside of the subway stations, are incredibly dangerous for pedestrian. Pedestrian safety is our number one priority here. So as part of the $194 million investment, there will be a full reconstruction of exterior street that includes um, infrastructure under the street, but it also includes rethinking pedestrian access, visibility, placemaking, and lighting, and lighting on the Deegan will need to be part of this in order to make sure that people actually are invited to cross these, what is a, and will continue to be a very large physical barrier. And any bridge access, uh, uh, pedestrian bridge access? So a, a huge part of the barrier again is like just getting onto the bridge and getting from the bridge into the neighborhood and vice versa and so we think that through the intersection like that is something that would be dealt with. We don't, the scope that we have right now, we don't foresee going um, directly into the bridge and, and further than the intersection, but this is something we can certainly look at. Hi, uh, two, two questions. Uh, I might have follow-up questions after we hear from folks from the community, but the two questions I have, you know, obviously there's a lot of detailed information about the, um, the capital infrastructure investments. It would be helpful to have detailed information about the expense level investments that seem to be spoken to, in particular youth services, workforce development, and, and any adult education. Is that, you know, you, you outline, you know, some of the four primary goals that, that folks in the community outlined. And if employment and workforce is one, it's, it's, I, think, I think what's being asked for is more than just access, but actual training so that folks can access those opportunities. Mm -hmm. And then the other point I wanted to ask is if you could just unpack a little bit more the part of the recommendation related to the MIH and the 80% of AMI, I think that's, I believe it's the first time it's coming before us to, to you know, basically increase the level of um, the parking, is, is the parking waiver requirement, oh. is it going beyond yes, what yes, is yes, normally yes. there? And that's right. I just want to understand how this might be a unique situation Correct. for that. Yeah. So just on the job training, um, and uh, job first is here, one of the, Really what we see the opportunity here is between our site and uh, the investment that the city is making as well as all the private investment that hopefully we will generate, there will be a lot of job opportunities coming in the area. And so we think that the first step to making sure that the community and local residents actually benefit from that is to build the pipeline so that folks that are in the community are ready and able to have and take opportunity of these, for these jobs when they come in. So we've worked with SBS and with a number of local organizations to try to um, create a coordinated effort among the local non-for-profits um, um, that work in that realm in the neighborhood so that they can work together towards a productive outcome. This has been done in other neighborhoods like the Lower East Side um, as part of the Seward Park project. We think the city has good models on how it's, it's tried um, to really channel uh, opportunities for jobs and development directly to the local community and that's the model we want to uh, take on. We think. We have uh, many years of investments here and a very long pipeline of employment opportunity, and so we, we want to build it. Um, on, the, on the parking question, we think here we have a, a, an, a, a unique opportunity and, and a unique kind of planning rationale for these, uh, the special permit, and I believe this is the first time the special permit is used, so we're kind of like excited about it. Um, uh, <laughs> we uh, we want to maximize affordable housing on the site, which was one of the finding. We, um, uh, we have really good transit access, amazing transit access in this neighborhood. And then we are right across from the Bronx Terminal Market, which, is a very, which has an extremely large uh, parking facility um, that is currently underused. 
And so we believe that this is an opportunity for, um, uh, for our site and our project to be able to fulfill like the parking demands that could come out of the project in the private market in a way that is cheaper than what we would be able to um, produce on the site and that would need to be subsidized with housing subsidies. If I could just add a little bit of history, um, during my tenure at EDC, the Bronx Terminal Market was mired in litigation with a prior designated developer. And so it was such a pleasure when Commissioner Marin took me around the site and to see the activity that is there and um, the fact that there is, uh, despite the vitality, because of the public transit, a parking structure that certainly has capacity. That's right. <laughs> I just had one. The one thing I would just ask, um, in addition to investing in the coordination um, related to the employment pipeline, I'm, I'm just wondering if there's a need to invest in the capacity of the local organizations to train more people for that pipeline. I think both should be looked at. Okay. Commissioner Eady. Just quickly, um, in regards to job, uh, job training and so forth, is Hostos involved in this planning process? Are they, I know they have like a workforce development center and they do some work in this area as well. Have they been part of these discussions? Yeah, yeah. so they've been uh, one of the kind of um, stakeholder that has been part of like the entire uh, uh, thinking behind the investments as well as the jobs pipeline. Um, so yes, they're part okay, of all great. of this conversation. Yeah. Other questions? Yes. Just a question which is, I guess, it's really more procedural in terms of the development of the infrastructure investment strategy. Mm -hmm. how, how is that created? I mean, I know there are other, we've seen other applications. It's funny how some questions come up. Mm -hmm. You think of some questions at different times, but it's really a question I wish I had asked previously in, in, um, in projects like this. But just in this particular one, how it's a 200 million dollar infrastructure strategy. Where did these concepts come from? How were they developed? Are you, is this something that the city is doing on its own with its own thought about what needs to be done to support this? But I'm assuming some of these things are not necessarily on and around the development site. They are, they're beyond because mm -hmm. obviously That's that right. support is needed yeah. beyond. Is it with the elected officials? Is it with key stakeholders in the community? What, how is the sure. strategy developed to get to, and I'm sure the strategy could have been a billion dollars, yeah, but, yeah, but yeah, it, yeah. It, how did you get to the 200 yeah. million yeah. In, in what type of a process? Sure, sure. So, um, and, and I think we're not the only neighborhood that had, Coney Island, for example, has a significant capital investment. So mm -hmm. I think at the, at the start of the administration, uh, really uh, trying to fulfill a housing plan <coughs> mandate or build more housing and building more affordable housing. Sure. The administration and DDC team were, were part of thinking about like where there is existing housing capacity that has been facilitated by rezonings that were done in, under the previous administration by this department that may not be fulfilled because there are like clear capacity uh, and infrastructure uh, needs. And so we did some uh, kind of early investigation to understand where, which were the neighborhood that had potential uh, and that demonstrated capacity for this housing growth and for the city sure. to meet its goal, as well as early investigation to understand what is the overall um, investment that would be necessary. Um, so working with DEP on understanding like sewer capacity, working with DOT to understand like their overall capital needs. So doing kind of a comprehensive capital um, uh, exercise with, with sister agencies and in coordination with city planning to try to come up with an envelope that we think is gonna be able to catalyze um, the, the potential and fulfill like the, the intent of these original projects. Okay, and, and so where does, if at all, sort of the community fit into? Because the, although communities would be concerned about DEP related projects, things, I, I would guess that they have, in, in looking at increased density and, and particularly residential population, yeah. they'll have more grassroots concerns, which may not always be capital, but they could be like schools yep. and, and other service-oriented development. Um, but then there's also the quality of life related issues mm -hmm. that are not capital, but yet would be needed to support new communities. That's right. So 
where, if at all, does that component exist? Yeah. It, it yeah. Does it exist? And did yeah. it exist? Did yeah, it? no, so absolutely. I think like the first question for us, for the city, was like, are there basic city infrastructure for which we are responsible that like today are not, we're not like, kind of, if you will, doing our job. So there, there are a number of sites in the area that just don't have access to sewers or water line. Sure, so thanks. just like at, at the most basic level, it's like how do we make sure there's like a, a level of services that allows for the area and for any private investment to happen. And then, and then the question is like, what is the thing, considering we have this envelope, what is the thing that would make the most difference to this community? For example, when we talk to folks, like the two things that were really, really important were waterfront access and open space, and realizing, you know, like the promise, if you will, of the, 20, uh, the 2009 mapping park land at 144th Street, and actually moving this project forward, as well as the notion that like this neighborhood would actually never get realized if people could not like um, could not cross the D again in a way that is actually safe. So these were the, the two resounding things that people were saying if the city has to spend like you know a large envelope of capital investment, if you don't do these things, like there is nothing else that you can do that will make actually a substantial difference. Um, and so it's through this kind of iterative dialogue and investigation that we came up with these kind of broad um, investment strategies. Thank you so much. If I could also note, because obviously city planning has been very involved right. in this partnership with right. EDC, the important role of elected officials, who sure. right. obviously are in touch with and speak for the community, and also the fact that city planning now has an enhanced role in the 10-year capital plan. And that's a way of looking forward with a planner's approach to where wise investments can be made to allow neighborhoods to flourish going forward. Great. Commissioner? Chair Laga. This one is sort of <laughs> to you, but it seems an appropriate juncture to ask the question. Considering we have a rezoning on, in East Harlem with a lot of planning going on, a possible esplanade expansion on the uh, east side, um, uh, and a bridge that 145th or 149th Street, depending on which side of the bridge you're <laughs> on, um, really would allow access both directions. Um, is there coordinated planning between the Manhattan office on the East Harlem uh, rezoning and the this particular activity with EDC. Yes. The answer is that. Like, it's all the same people working on all these projects. <laughs> is what I will say. Yes. Thanks. I also note that here you have before you today, EDC. We have a speaker coming up from the Parks Department, but this planning effort went well beyond. It included DEP. It included transportation. A, a whole alphabet soup of That's city right. agencies. That's right. Yes, Commissioner Delhouse. So for those, for those of us keeping score at home about how much has been committed um, towards the Neighborhood Development Fund or from the Neighborhood Development Fund, is the $194 million coming from the Neighborhood Development Fund, the, the billion dollar fund that was no, committed no. as part of the 15 rezoning? No, it's right. a separate allocation. That's helpful. Yep. Commissioner Levin. Um, so this is a wonderful portrait of collaborative work by government agencies, and I do think that we're making much better progress toward integrated planning across all, all of these agencies. But I have to revert to the comments of um, the Vice Chair and Commissioner Cantor and several others. You're asking us, as a planning commission, to take an awful lot on faith. Now, if you would promise to stay <laughs> in power forever and committed to the kind of community engagement you're talking about, um, I feel a lot better, but we all know that's not going to happen. Well, maybe you are going to stay forever, but administ administrations come and go, and um, the administrative priorities will come and go, and by the time this project comes to be built, there could be very different things that the city is trying to accomplish. Um, and there will be no formal public oversight process um, to ensure that all the wonderful things that you're describing here are actually being implemented, shaped in the way that we all hope will happen. I don't think there's probably an answer to that, but that's, I think, what a lot of us are really concerned about um, with this proposal, which essentially asks us to give you an agency which, frankly, over the past stretch of time, not immediately, but the past stretch of time, has been um, well known for being quite opaque and impossible for 
um, the public to understand what's going on. That's a big worry. Um, but I have, I have two sort of specific programmatic questions yep. here. One is if you could please tell us a little bit more about the plans for um, commercial use and community facility use. We have some, inf we have barely information about the affordable housing program. Up to half of it would be affordable at levels of 80% AMI and below. So we've been told a little bit about the affordable housing proposal, that's not a whole lot to go on, and we know that the community wants it to be 100% affordable. Mm -hmm. um, but you've said nothing to us about the kind of um, commercial use you anticipate, and we know from the community there's a desire for community facility use. You indicated both of those were um, acknowledged priorities. Um, and then the second question is about, as long as you're talking about infrastructure, about schools. Mm -hmm. Because the environmental work here reveals that there will be a significant um, adverse impact for schools, and there's only going to be more development in the area because of all of the positive features that you described of the area. And we have a responsibility to plan for schools going forward. So if you could speak to sure. commercial I'll take them in order. Okay, um, thank you. So on the affordable housing, while the EIS uh, like, uh, creates a framework that's at 50% below uh, 80% and 50% above, the goal, our goal, HPD's goal on that side is to maximize affordability. That's what was in the RFEI, and that's what we want to do. So we're hoping to get to as close to 100%, if not 100%, uh, on that site. Like, that is actually our goal. We've received a lot of feedback through the process. Um, the community board, the rural president, around the range of AMI, there seems to be consensus in the neighborhood that the goal here is to be able to target all AMIs from low to, um, uh, to higher at 120, 130. Um, so again, our goal and, and, and the efforts, and like Ed, if you want to talk a little bit more in detail uh, about that, is to try to reach all of these bands uh, as stated in the recommendations. It has become increasingly common in our projects, particularly larger ones where you have more flexibility to do things, to have ranges, wide ranges. Um, and so in a project like this, we would anticipate that there would be a range of probably about 30% AMI to 130% AMI. Um, and while the EIS used that cutoff point, you know, half 80 above and below, you know, it might well be a little more weighted to the lower end of that, uh, um, the actual project that comes out. You know, with every project that comes through, you know, it depends on the interest of the community, the interest of the developer, the market, you know, what is uh, possible at the time. You know, we're not going to do 130% AMI, you know, 200 units at 130% AMI in areas that, that it's just not going to sell, not going to rent. Um, but, um, and, and the other thing is that very often these things are not absolutely finalized until late in the game. It's not unusual that we might come in front of you with a Euler for disposition on city-owned land, um, and then subsequent to that, the market changes, construction costs have gone up, um, and therefore they, the, some of the units have to be shifted from one level to the other. So that's why we can't sit here today and say exactly what it's going to break down to be. But again, the aim is to have a range of about 30% to 130% um, with, with the bulk, almost like a bell curve, you know, more toward the middle there. Um, Cecilia mentioned the community boards. Um, they are asking strongly for a, a mixed income, for diversity. Our range board four years ago put itself on record as wanting a much more mixed income. Um, and so when you have a project like this that's going to run whatever it is, several hundreds of units, obviously, um, you have that kind of flexibility to, uh, to be able to do that, to, have a, to, to provide a good chunk of very low and a good chunk of moderate at the same time and in the same project. Um, on the commercial and the, the community facility, um, so we think this site, because of its substantial size, because also of its location, close to Millpond Park, close to Bronx Terminal Market, has the capacity to absorb a significant amount of commercial and community facility space. Uh, we think, um, and, and that was reflected in the RFEI, and something that was part of the community dialogue, that having like a a, a, a large kind of cultural or community facility institution that would really become an anchor and draw people to the site and to the waterfront um, will be really important to its success as a project. So that's certainly something that we're hoping we can realize uh, through the selection, and that's our goal here. Um, and then finally on schools, um, 
we, uh, our, our site is uh, generating a school need and uh, we're um, uh, dealing with this issue uh, on the EIS by having SEA commit to um, uh, continue to monitor uh, the construction of the site. Uh, SEA is very aware of the existing school needs of existing residents and students in the area that is, that is uh, an issue prior to any kind of future development coming in. Um, they, uh, they're actively looking for a site and, and actively trying to secure funding in the next capital plan to be able to fulfill this requirement. And we're certainly through this project and through the investment that we're doing because it is such a, an acute um, community need and political issue, uh, definitely working really closely with them to be able to meet these goals. Okay. Is there any chance the school would fit in this project? It is not. Uh, like, so in. That was the first question we asked ourselves. The first question we asked um, SCA, because of its, not even if it's a great site, remote location from the residential community and the fact that you have to go, even though we're redesigning this intersection through a very, very complex intersection in Large Avenue, we're not sure like this is the right site. Um, SEA also likes to have sites which have their own outdoor space that is like secure and only at the service of the school and so that would really kind of jeopardize the seamlessness um, uh, of the transition between Millpond Park, the open space, the waterfront, our site. It would just create a very, very different project and so we're hoping we can achieve the existing school needs in a different site than our site. Commissioner Gallo. I'm just going back to the affordable housing <clears throat> potential ranges from 30 to 130 percent of AMI. What what is market at in the area today? What's the AMI level that's market? Um, one of the things that we've been doing is we are seeing uh, the start of some non-subsidized development in the area. You know, I look at the INVI website every day to see you know what who filed with the buildings department that we don't know about, meaning that we're not subsidizing. And then I've tried occasionally to contact those people, say, okay, you're obviously doing what you're calling market. You know, what do you think that's going to be? Um, the last person I asked something like this, um, and again, you were talking, you know, the South Bronx is a big area, so what may apply six blocks over may not make sense here. Um, he was um, he was figuring on like 80 to 90 percent AMI. So in other words, the rents he's figuring on would equate to about 80, 90 percent. Um, at the same time, some of the existing buildings uh, on their vacancies, they're getting more than that. Um, but at the same time, even if that's the reality, you know, we want to be um, providing for uh, the, uh, the existing population as well. Um, although there again, there's, there's a range, there's diversity. You know, we all, we're familiar with what the average incomes are in the area. Um, and yet I always tell the story to take up too much time, but I tell you a story that I, I fairly regularly go to a lot of housing land use committees of community boards in the South Bronx, and I'll go one month and I'll be told there'll be a presentation by a developer for a project, and someone will get up and say, our oh, people can't afford those rents at all. You know, don't you know what the average incomes are here? And then I'll go back to the very same meeting the next month, and they'll say, what are you doing for our young professionals who grew up in the area and would like to stay in the area or move back to the area? Um, who are making 70000 and they've gotten a good education. And the answer is both arguments are correct, and therefore we are trying to do what we can. And that's why we very much are trying to advocate for the wider ranges that have been done in years past. For many, many, many years, almost every project that was done in the South Bronx was 60% AMI. Excuse me, 60% AMI. Um, and we recognize, and the mayor, in fact, uh, increased the portion of the plan to go much lower than that. At the same time, we'll of course continue to go higher if possible as well. Thank you. Other questions? Yes, Commissioner Cantor. Thank you. You make a very good presentation, but in the presentation, you acknowledge it's potential problems, potential problems, potential problems, all of which are logical to a project this size. This past Monday, we had some uh, an applicant come in on the uh, Brooklyn Domino job to get a modification to landscaping, change from grass to another project, another, another product. I'm not suggesting we go to that level of, of uh, involvement, but the 
again, encourage several of our commissioners. What mechanism do you see coming forward that would allow a future commission to be involved in some changes, whether it be at the waterfront or up other upland? How does the City Planning Commission get back into the process so that a developer just doesn't feel he can make a deal with you and then do whatever he wants? Sure. So I think I'll, um, again, we understand that that's an issue in this project and, and the bus depot project in East Harlem, and both our agencies are in active dialogue to come up with an approach um, uh, for the commission to be able to continue um, uh, its review of quality design post-approval and post-selection of a developer. Thank you. And if I might elaborate upon that, I think that um, Commissioner Ortiz put it quite well that we are putting in place a strong framework and it's a framework that was developed with very significant city planning input. If there is to be a change to the framework, that sure. requires new approvals. Um, and so that's why we have spent so much time on the details of the framework, where the towers could be located, what amount of transparency is required, heights of street wall. So that already is um, a significant, I think constraint is the wrong word, but it's, it helps shape the framework. Hearing the commission's concerns, we're involved in productive discussions with EDC about how we can assure that city planning can continue to play its role post the selection of the developer to assure that there is good massing, good bulk, good urban design carried through in the actual project that comes forward. And I would expect to be able to discuss it with the commission at the review session that we will have in advance of a vote on this project. Any other questions? Thank you very much. I'll now continue with other registered speakers. Um, our next speaker is Alyssa Cobb-Conan. Good morning. Commissioners, good morning, Chair Lago. I'm Alyssa Cobb-Conan, Assistant Commissioner for Planning and Development at New York City Parks. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Parks is ex committed to expanding waterfront access along the Harlem River and improving open space, and we have many recent projects that work to accomplish this. We've recently refurbished the historic High Bridge in 2015 and completed Bridge Park in the Bronx north of the High Bridge, and we continue to advocate for funding for the waterfront access along the High Bridge area. We're also currently pursuing acquisition of the Putnam Rail Line, which will create an important greenway connection from the Harlem River up through Van Cortlandt Park and further north into Westchester County. Partnering with BCEQ and New York State in 2015, we completed the Harlem River Brownfield Opportunity Area, which outlines a comprehensive vision for the Bronx waterfront of the Harlem River. To the south, we're working closely with EDC to acquire and develop a 2.3-acre waterfront park at 144th Street, as Cecilia just mentioned. And in 2009, Parks and EDC completed Mill Pond Park at Piers 1 through 4, which was formerly the Bronx Terminal Market. The Lower Concourse Project will continue to help us achieve our goals of expanding waterfront access and improving public open space by providing over two acres of new open space and presenting an opportunity to provide amenities the community has been requesting on the waterfront, as well as expanding towards a more continuous waterfront esplanade. The residential and commercial uses on the site will bring more eyes on the neighboring Mill Pond Park and will therefore make park visitors feel safer. And while we believe this project will accomplish many of the city's objectives, we also understand that some members of the community feel that this site is already parkland. I'd like to take the time now to address those concerns. In 2006, New York City Parks was assigned jurisdiction of Piers 1 through 5. And for the record, the mere assignment of those parcels to New York City Parks did not establish them as parkland. Although some may associate Pier 5 with the Yankee Stadium and Gateway Center projects, the commitment to create park like parkland at Pier 5 was not part of either. In connection with a new Yankee Stadium project, a total of 22 
20.42 acres of parkland was alienated and a replacement of 24.5 acres was both acquired and developed and included piers two to three to the north of the site in front of you today, which was mapped parkland. Sorry, piers two and three were mapped parkland. Piers four and five are not mapped as park. Pier four was developed as open space in connection with the Gateway Center project. And Pier 5, which New York City Parks was assigned in 2006, this area has remained vacant and unimproved for the last 10 years, and funding for its development as a park was never secured. As stewards of parkland, if you could parks wrap it up, Ms. Popconan. May I? Yeah, okay, thank you. Parks is committed to create and sustain thriving parks for all New Yorkers. We're avid protectors of this incredibly important resource. <coughs> And although Pier 5 had been in Parks' portfolio, it is neither mapped nor dedicated parkland, and Parks supports EDC's proposal for this site as it delivers new open space and expands waterfront access to the public. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Questions for Ms. Kopkonen? Okay, thank you. Our next speaker in support is Charlie Sambai. Uh, hi, good morning to the commission. Um, my name is Charlie Sanboy. I'm an assistant vice president for EDC, for their government relations division. Uh, I'm here reading a letter uh, to the commission uh, on behalf of uh, Community Board 4, uh, whose chair was not able to be here today. Um, this letter will be submitted on the record uh, in addition to uh, their full recommendation that was given uh, to the commission uh, in May of this year. I write to the City Planning Commission with respect to land use application C170311 ZMX, C170314 PPX, and N170312 ZRX, the necessary applications that can facilitate the development of the Lower Concourse North site as it is now referred to as. I am the chairperson of 2 Community Board 4 where the Lower Concourse North project is located. On May 23, 2017, CB4 voted in the affirmative to approve these applications with modifications and conditions. Our recommendations provided our perspective with respect to the income bands that this project should serve, building heights, employment opportunities, open space, school siting, transportation improvements, parking, <coughs> public transportation improvements, the installation of a bridge at 153rd Street, community recreation space, health and wellness assessment, and a community engagement process. While our full recommendation is attached, I wanted to highlight several issues we feel the city should address. To the extent of this application, the intent of this application before you is to create a mixed-use development which would include up to 1,045 units of new housing, ground retail space, office space, community facility space, and publicly accessible open space to the Harlem River waterfront. The board believes that as a city-sponsored site, the residents of Community District 4 should be the beneficiaries of this project. In order to achieve these ends, we believe that all of the housing developed as part of the Lower Concourse North site should be affordable. It should be noted that the AMI for Community District 4 is around 26,000, which is equal to 30 to 40 percent of AMI, but roughly 25 percent of households earn more than 50 percent, fifty thousand dollars a year, which is approximately 60 to 70 percent of AMI for a family of three. As such, there is a need in our district for affordable housing at a range of income bands including low, moderate, and, and middle income. With respect to the building heights, we request that the maximum building height of the site is limited to 300 feet and that the de design pays particular attention to views and access related to safety and security. Open space is a topic that we understand is of major concern to many stakeholders. We would like to call to attention to the fact that Community Board 4 has the largest number of parks properties, 101, in the borough, which includes Mill Pond Park, one of the busiest in the district. However, the project site is a city-owned property and as such should be utilized in a manner that maximizes public benefit. Understanding that the applicant per the DGEIS has proposed a project that will include 2.96 acres of open space, we ask that all of the open space be publicly accessible. We also call on the future developer to, re to be responsible for maintaining all of Mill Pond Park or that the city provide increasing in fun funding to alleviate the burden of the already understaffed Bronx Parks Department. I'd like to read the last point. 
Okay, if you could wrap it up, because I'll also note that we have the full community board sure. uh, recommendation in our materials, and we will read the letter when it's submitted. Sure. Uh, we welcome investment in the development of this Bronx neighborhood that will bring children and families closer to the waterfront and provide the affordable housing and amenities they need to lead successful lives. We ask that the city also be responsive to the needs of existing residents to help bring this neighborhood to where it is today. We hope to work in partnership with the city of New York to responsibly develop the site and the surrounding area and bring the greatest amount of benefits to the greatest amount of people. Sincerely signed, Kathleen Saunders, Chairperson of Community Board 4. Thank you. Thank you. Questions for Mr. Salvador? Thanks. Our next speaker is John Falcone. <laughs> Taking the long way around. Uh, good afternoon, Chairperson Lago and uh, Vice Chair Knuckles and distinguished uh, commissioners. My name is JT Falcone, and I am the Partnerships and Programs Associate at Jobs First NYC, a policy to practice intermediary working to improve the workforce development system and ensure that all New Yorkers are in a position to access and climb the economic ladder of New York City's labor market. For 10 years, Jobs First NYC has been working with local communities and citywide, developing and supporting collaborative and innovative strategies to find effective solutions to support out of school out of work young New Yorkers. We are here today to lift up one such strategy, the Lower East Side Employment Network, Lesson, that has for the last nine years worked to serve the needs of the residents of the Lower East Side <laughs> while that neighborhood has seen a swell of economic development activity. The coalition of eight nonprofit agencies came together in partnership with their local community board, CB3, in a neighborhood wide effort to ensure that local residents were appropriately trained and positioned to benefit from those opportunities as they arose. By agreeing to collaborate rather than compete, these eight nonprofit agencies have improved their engagement of local employers and developers to the benefit of residents of the Lower East Side. With CB3 as a partner, Lesson is able to leverage this strong relationship to negotiate with incoming employers. Further, because the employers have clear access points for talent, they know where they can reach out when they need local candidates, and the nonprofits, by pooling their resources, can offer a broader range of training options and ready a larger talent pool. Thus, the network collectively fills a greater percentage of job openings than a single agency would exclusively fill in its own and maintain deeper relationships with a larger array of employers. All parties benefit from the employer-facing network model. The lesson partners have engaged 173 businesses as of June 2017 and achieved a three to one interview to hire ratio, reducing costs associated with referring and interviewing excess candidates. What's more, incoming businesses give lesson partners lead time on projected jobs. And because of this advance notice, they're able to build out customized programs for residents to ensure that they're skilled and credentialed in what employers need expanding employment access for local community <coughs> residents. As testimony to the value businesses see in the lesson, they have taken the notable step of signing MOUs designating a 30% local hire expectation at Essex Crossings, a new large-scale development project in the Lower East Side, which I want to add is unprecedented. Given the contextual similarities between the Essex Crossing development and the work in the Lower Concourse, that's on the agenda today, the New York City Economic Development Corporation approached Jobs First NYC early last year to discuss the possibility of developing a similar employer-facing network in the lower concourse. Since that time, we have worked to gauge the local workforce community's interest in, ex in exploring an employer-facing model and found them to be receptive, particularly given Lesson's success. Based on our firsthand experience working with Lesson, the opportunity to develop a similar model to serve the lower concourse would help the community to better prepare and serve not only public development activities, but the private development that is sure to follow. <laughs> May I finish? One sentence left. Go for it. By facilitating direct connections between existing residents and new businesses, an employer-facing network can help to ensure that the improvements to the neighborhood are good for all New Yorkers, particularly those that call the surrounding neighborhoods home. Thank you. I was just asking if you could maybe elaborate a little bit more on what your investigation has um, revealed about organizations in this neighborhood that might be able to participate in such an e effort um, and what steps you're going to take to um, 
build the network? Can it, can it work here in the same way? Is there the capacity here to work the same way? I mean, you, you, you summarized the conclusion that it was uh, possible to do it here, but I guess I'd like to know a little bit more about the local components. So one of the benefits of, um, of the existence of the lesson model as a reference point is that there are similarities and parallels with the lower concourse region. Um, particularly, I would want to draw upon the fact that um, there is a long history of workforce development agencies that have deep relationships with the community, deep ties, and are actually, um, though any nonprofit provider will tell you that uh, more funding is always critical, um, they are relatively well positioned and, and have long experience serving those communities. So the benefit of the lesson model and, and the employer facing network model at large is that by collaborating, they better align those resources. So the answer I would posit will, the, the model itself can work in the, the South Bronx based on three factors, which are, which are the critical factors. One is that there are, is already an existing culture of collaboration in the South Bronx between nonprofit providers in recognition of the severity and the stark um, poverty situations that are in, in many different pockets of the region. Um, these nonprofit providers have come together many times in the past, and they, they advocate together, they meet together. Uh, for example, South Bronx Rising Together is, is a great example of a coalition of nonprofit providers that work together and, and align best practices. Um, the, the situation with the economic development that's, that's supposed to come is really important because, as we noted in, in the earlier conversation about the bid, actually, a lot of the businesses in the area tend to be small mom and pop shops, which require a different strategy typically than these larger developments would. And so the, the technical assistance that Jobs First would be able to and, and would be providing in this effort to align and build out the, the network would go towards addressing the concerns of, um, of nonprofits who are used to dealing in one situation but need assistance in turning and, and working more with, with larger developments. And finally, uh, and critically, they want to do it. <laughs> uh, it's, it's less of a model, ultimately, when you talk to Lesson than it is a matter of interpersonal relationships that have held the work together. And um, in, the, in the conversations that I've had that have ranged from grassroots organizers um, to, uh, to, to the Children's Aid Society and the Bronx Works and the Phipps Neighborhoods that are the behemoths of the South Bronx, um, everyone is receptive and interested, interested. That's one of the nice things about workforce development is that we tend to be relatively bipartisan and we can work through these different coalitions. Was it that were always the case? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, think, <clears throat> I think your description is really helpful, and the description of what's been going on the lower side is helpful. And I think your acknowledgement that, uh, in addition to coordination and rationalizing resources, having more resources is always something that's welcome. I guess the question I have, you know, especially given the um, example you gave of the lower east side and the importance of the community board's involvement um, in that process to create leverage. In this situation, given how this is being proposed, we might be giving up some of that leverage um, in the future. So, uh, it, it, you know, basically, we'd be put, putting the parameters in place now, and then, you know, the RFEI has gone out, um, a developer will be selected, and, and then the, commu the community's leverage is really um, either what is created. Uh, through other organizing means or perhaps through these working groups. Would you have any concern that that may be insufficient to develop, uh, to achieve some of the outcomes that have been achieved on the Lower East Side? I think it's tough to draw a perfect parallel due to some of the concerns that you're raising, for sure. Um, I would argue that one of the benefits of the community board's involvement, especially given that um, development spurs all kinds of job activity fallout that we can't necessarily predict, no matter how hard we try to analyze the data and, and how much history we have to point to. That being the case, the relationships with community boards are very important for businesses that come in, because the developers who build, they have one set of, of um, jobs that they create in that activity. But the permanent jobs left behind, ultimately, it's not the developers who decide who staffs the, mm -hmm. the, the retail chain. It's not the developers who decides who staffs the office that's built or, or whatever may pass. But the community board in a relationship, a working relationship, a friendly relationship with the community board um, for those businesses does remain critical. 
when they're looking to get a liquor license, when they're looking to do any number of sustained activities that will over time be, be relevant and important. Um, so when I point to the, the importance of the community board's involvement in negotiating terms for local hire, while we might not be able to achieve the same results in the same way, I think that we can certainly learn and draw upon the lessons learned from lesson to apply where, where we can. I, I think we have, we have the kind of lead time on this project that we really can work strategically to do as deep of an analysis as human beings can do. And um, because of the partnership of EDC and the transparency that they've shown with Jobs First and, and the organizations in, in aligning this effort and, and making sure that um, this is possible, I think that we have a leg up in many ways um, because the lesson itself originated before uh, Essex Crossing, but um, they had to spend a number of years scrambling, um, and we can take those lessons learned and start running. Lessons from lesson. <laughs> Isn't it fun? Sure fun. I think the coalition building is a, a great sign and will certainly help in funding of workforce training by national uh, philanthropy in New York City, which I think is really pretty critical. I would hope that um, any group looking at workforce training would also look at the supply chain for the building trades and since there is an opportunity here that doesn't exist in the Lower East Side in the IBZ, if there's any way to encourage some uh, active participation with smaller building trades and linking them up to the larger developers, the local small um, core supply chain, that would really be extraordinary. A million dollar question. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Thank you, Mr. Falcone. Thank you. Our next speaker in support is Michael Brady. In case I'm long-winded, <laughs> start down there. An appropriate time to remind folks that speakers are limited to three minutes. Yeah. <laughs> With a little bit of wiggle room sometimes. Re brevity is the soul of wit. So. Good morning. Thank you, uh, commissioners, directors, for being present today and the opportunity to testify. My name is Michael Brady, the executive director of the Third Avenue Business Improvement District, <clears throat> located in the South Bronx. The district serves over 200,000 South Bronx residents daily and is the second busiest commercial corridor in the city of New York, second to Times Square. The district boasts over 200 businesses and will expand that reach in 2019 to include 800 new businesses along 149th Street and the Grand Concourse to St. Anne's Avenue and along Melrose Avenue. <clears throat> the district is the closest commercial corridor to the Grand, Con to the Grand Concourse North project <clears throat> and is also the gateway to the South Bronx. In addition to being a 15-year resident of the South Bronx, my former career was in the field of urban planning and development. Prior to joining the Third Avenue bid, I was the master planner for the South Bronx waterfront under the auspices of the New York State Department of State through the South Bronx Overall Economic Development Corporation. I also managed the five IBZs in the Bronx. During my tenure, I worked closely with the community, city planning, New York State, New York City DOT, DEC, DEP, the Mayor's Office for Environmental Remediation, the EDC, and a host of agencies to tackle the challenges of multiple rezonings, the first in the late 90s and most recently in 2009, and I've worked with multiple DCP and EDC teams as city agencies and administrations have seen multiple turnovers. Throughout the process, the fundamental concern and guiding principle was that of equity. The result of the work was a master plan for the Harlem River waterfront that was released two years ago and dovetailed with significant master planning for the Port Morris East River section of the South Bronx. To my knowledge, this document as well as others were used to inform the EDC and DCP framework for the area's development. Our work was guided by the question of how can we provide an equitable platform and equitable resources for South Bronx residents, residents that were neglected for so long, residents who stayed throughout decades of community disinvestment. The result was a plan to create between 9,000 and 12,000 new <coughs> units of mixed income housing along the waterfront combined with waterfront, waterfront access, open space, a public esplanade, major infrastructure improvements, and the natural growth of small businesses along the 132nd Street, exterior, River, 3rd, Bruckner, and Lincoln Avenues. Part of that planning was also in including activating blighted city-owned land that had been neglected, was contaminated, and in my view, positioned as catalytic sites for development. The two major parcels were the Velodrome site, now referred to as Grand Concourse North, and the Paddo Wagon site. Both had great potential to provide all the amenities community residents demanded, but also had significant challenges. I understand the nuance, nuances of the Yankee Stadium deal. I also understand the community's desire and need for additional open space to combat high asthma rates and again position the South Bronx to receive the same equity as our counterparts in Manhattan and Brooklyn. 
I would encourage a compromise between the two seemingly divergent groups at the table. You see, we need both housing and open space. In 2015, I presented Bronx City Planning with three scenarios that would yield more open space and distribute it equitably throughout the entire South Bronx. Although more complicated, it would necessitate the EDC to negotiate with several property owners, the net square footage of open space would be significantly more than what is being discussed uh, during the Yankee Stadium deal and significantly more than what is being proposed today. Grand Concourse North has the ability to significantly change the area and have the city take control over the real estate market, which of late has been driven by market speculation and threatens to displace residents and businesses. By creating... 30 seconds. 30 seconds, great. <laughs> By creating a permanent affordable housing development with open space, the city can control the conversation and pump approximately 1,000 units of needed affordable housing into the area. It is my belief that we can and should have the best of both worlds. The South Bronx should not forsake open space for affordable housing. I would encourage city planning to explore the scenarios presented to them years ago and also consider the viability of activating portions of the paddy wagon site to create additional open access uh, and space for South Bronx residents. I would encourage our South Bronx residents to be open to compromise and the development potential of this affordable housing, which can and must be a tool to prevent displacement. I thank you for your time today. Should you require further information on anything I discussed, please let me know. And thank you for your service, your background. Uh, suggest that the Third Avenue bid is uh, fortunate to have you there. Thank you. Question? Yes, Commissioner Delos. Thank you for being here. Um, can you share what you presented years ago? Uh, that's a follow-up. I can. I can actually send a report and slides. I didn't bring it today because I wasn't sure how relevant it would be to the conversation, but I'm certainly happy to. Uh, there are three scenarios ranging from about uh, 2.6 acres access to parkland to about seven acres of parkland. And, and you've, you've shared this, with how Bronx. recently have you shared this with the folks? So um, Bronx City Planning and City Planning was a partner uh, during the um, Harlem River Brownfield Opportunity Area uh, mm -hmm. study, oh, yeah. of which we went through the three phases. Mm -hmm. um, the final phase has just been completed, it's designated, lots of tax credits going in there. Uh, the open space... Congratulations, it oh. takes a while. Well, I, I don't own the property, but I wish. Still. <laughs> um, <laughs> But part of that was uh, an open space plan that was conducted by uh, WXY. Uh, so the information may be slightly dated, just in terms of the market study and, and some numbers that have fluctuated. Uh, but it's certainly relevant. Thank you. Other questions? Commissioner Steve. Then could you clarify the ways in which, um, you know, perhaps using some of the um, boards we have here, the ways in which the, the plan that was developed, I presume you're referring to the WXY uh, BOA yes. plan, which I presume also included some degree of outreach and community yeah. input, yeah. Um, how that differs from what we're seeing here. Sure, so just to back up slightly on that, um, the BOA process was facilitated by uh, SOBRA, the South Bronx Overall Economic Development Corporation, of which I oversaw the process, uh, WXY, AKRF, and Magnuson Architecture and Planning. Uh, it, culminated uh, you know, an eight-year process going through the various steps of the BOA program. Uh, the, the end result was... Um, Could you please take the microphone with you? Oh, is Thanks. it? Oh, great. I feel like Dana White. <laughs> great. Uh, the result was uh, three scenarios. Uh, one that uh, included a more equitable distribution of green space along the entire waterfront. So instead of just the 40-foot requirement that it's currently required under DCP, it would require a little bit more of the taking there. But that would trigger a taking, which instead of dealing with one property owner, uh, Pantheon Properties up here, you would have to deal with probably about seven different property owners to do a taking. Um, so yes, it was more complicated. But you know, the community feedback that we did through um, several visioning sessions over those years, you know, it, it really drove home the, the idea that having equitable access to park, parkland would not only service all of the population here, including a huge uh, a quantity of public housing down here, but it would also yield a higher square footage of open space. So you'd have the 40 square feet of open space. You'd have maybe an additional 25 feet of, 25 feet of green space adjacent to, uh, next to that. But then you would also have green space up here, a smaller footprint, a smaller footprint here at Harlem River, but you would have it m more equitably dis dispersed throughout the entire waterfront. And the goal was <laughs> that eventually this, this esplanade would connect over 132nd Street through Brown Place to the Randalls Island Connector and then connect on the opposite side with the Great Bronx Greenway, um, which we were working with um, Manhattan Beer, Oak Point Properties to have them contribute to that effort. So you would have this um, you know, kind of great connection that would um, connect the West Bronx 
to the, to the East Bronx. Um, with that, there was dovetailed um, transportation uh, alternatives, for example, uh, negotiating with CSX Rail to potentially uh, include a commuter rail so people could live over here in the West Bronx but commute to their jobs in the East Bronx because the East Bronx is the home of the Port Morris IBZ. So just to, then to follow up on that, um, so the current plan includes a, a 40 foot wide connection that um, presumably would accomplish some of what you're talking about in terms of getting people from the Mitchell houses up um, you know, without necessarily engaging in sort of a high stakes, high cost yeah. taking. So, you know, what what is the incremental benefit of going that route? The difference is the difference is about between three acres of open space and seven acres of open space. Three, okay, and so seven, so significant. Okay, um, you know that's so well. Seven, I guess so, it depends know. on on what you're measuring it against and what right. the costs are and the time frame. Absolutely. Um, so I presume that that's. I'm just trying to understand the. No, no, I, no, and, and, I, and ultimately, you know, when you're going, as I'm sure all of you know, when you're going through the planning process, you know, we just present the scenarios and we say this is what this could yield if this happens, right? And then you figure out how feasible. <laughs> right, and then then the next step is a feasibility study of yeah. okay, how much would this actually cost? And you know, when AKRF we plugged in our pro forma, you know, this, we, so we had, approached it from two two um, ways. A master plan, so the city of New York comes in and does a taking of all this, how much would that cost? And then if we did, you know, section by section with property owners doing their own, own deal. If the city did it, the, the cost would have been really staggering. There were pro forma numbers that were just too high for anyone to really comprehend. So the, the opposite was, okay, well, well, private owners, right? And the, the thing that we had to kind of address and tackle were, you know, how do these private owners engage with the public esplanade? Because at that time, the requirements for the public esplanade were not published. So, but we had active market rate developers engaging in the area. You know, you have Somerset Chetri properties, which are doing about 2,000 units down here. Ken Cohen, who, of whom a par a parcels being, having a taking, is doing 310 units of affordable housing here. Um, you have a ton of new housing along 138th Street I, corridor. Yeah, no, I un yeah. understand. You know, I, um, uh, mostly, I guess this doesn't necessarily preclude some of those property owners from pursuing right. open space within right. their plans because they recognize that there's a value to it. So, right. so you know, I, I, I get it. Thank, yeah. thank you. And, I, you know, I think it would be great if, you know, there was a way, and I'm sure there is, there's $200 million to play with, to incentivize some of those developers to include a little bit more open space in exchange mm -hmm. for tax credits, et cetera. You know, there's wiggle room. Thank you. Sure. Other questions? <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Brady, although I'd never suggest that we're playing with $200 million. <laughs> we can play the money game. Just have a call from the sky. Thank you. Our next speaker in support is Margaret Lee. Actually, this is uh, Mike Morrill on behalf of Young Women Associates. Um, if you would have to sign in, that will... I did, actually. Um, I don't know if there... you... Yeah, Margaret's not here, but I'm from the same company. Okay, if you, if you will sign in, we'll get to you. No, it's okay. I mean, I did sign in. I don't know why... This means I signed in, We'll come back to it. Um, so continuing in order, our next speaker in support is Robert Holbrook. Uh, good afternoon, commissioners. Um, I don't have any testimony today, but I'm here uh, from EDC. I'm the director of planning at EDC. I'm available for any questions on the environmental review or any follow-up questions. Um, I was expecting to go last um, after after the testimony, but um, here I am. <laughs> Any questions for Mr. Holbrook? Thank you. Thank you. Um, our next speaker in support is Kate Van Tassel. Okay. And then our next speaker in support is Michael Manola. Manola, right? Mo Sorry. Wrong. I, I, uh, I broke any protocol. <laughs> We're welcoming your comments now. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Lago, Vice Chair Knuckles, Commissioners. My name is Michael Marola. I am the Chief Operating Officer and General Counsel of Young Women Associates. We are um, rehabilitating the Bronx Post Office at 149th Street and Grand Concourse. And I'm speaking today in favor of the Lower Concourse North proposal as a catalyst for further growth in this dynamic neighborhood. Thank you for allowing me this opportunity to speak about the South Bronx. Young Wu is a developer based in New York. For the past 37 years, we've built
built our company on two principles, identifying emerging markets and then providing a catalyst in those markets to spur economic growth. In 2013, 2014, we identified the Bronx, as many others have, as an emerging market. We were attracted to many of the same statistics that brought other developers to the Bronx, so 400,000 residents, 37,000 employees in the vicinity of the post office, 13,000 students, 7 million bus and subway riders, and also the $32 million of retail spending that we thought was uh, being spent outside of the vicinity and that we could recapture uh, in the vicinity. Um, so we knew the opportunity existed to uh, bring something dynamic to the South Bronx. We were also attracted to a particular development site uh, if you're familiar with the Bronx Bo Post Office, the site was constructed in 1935, landmarked in 1976, and joined the N National Registry of Historic Places in 1980. But beyond the numbers in the building, we were also attracted to the community, the history of the community, and what we saw as the future of the community. To that end, we purchased the site and began development plans to meet the needs of this growing community. The 175,000 square foot building will have 50,000 square feet of retail below grade and first floor, 75,000 square feet of first class office space, and the first, as far as we know, rooftop venue in the Bronx of about 25,000 square feet. We are currently nearing a TCO for the building, and we are in conversations with major national retail brands that just a few years ago were not likely to view the Bronx as the destination. The office space, which will be established as a co-working space will be configured to allow local residents to have their own working spaces and we expect to attract uh, local startup companies. We're also in negotiations with a significant local stakeholder for a lease for a significant portion of the office space. We are creating a retail market for local residents as well. This project is bringing to the Bronx residents the very same amenities and services they were leaving the Bronx to find. Co-working space, as I said, will have the potential for startup uh, businesses. We believe that the Lower Concourse North is a natural next step as a catalyst for growth in the neighborhood and will meet the growing demands of this community. Thank you. Question? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we now will turn to speakers in opposition. Linda Cunningham. Thanks for the opportunity to speak. Um, I will start with the fact that um, I came here uh, back when the Port Morris, Mott Haven area was rezoned and uh, spoke to the hearing. I came also again when the rezoning occurred that is relevant to what we are con currently considering on the Harlem River. Um, in what happened when the rezoning occurred in Port Morris and Mud Haven, is it was done with no uh, restrictions or no uh, uh, accommodations for affordability and also no uh, co accommodations for waterfront access for the community. When I moved to the South Bronx in 2000, there were already a community group that was out there lobbying and trying to get um, community support gathered to approach the city. And so there's been a 20-year effort for the community to have more access to the waterfront. Now, what I, what I want to say, first of all, is um, if I take the microphone over here with, with me, we're talking about one small area up here of parkland and a sliver along here. This sliver of development for waterfront access could happen without the current uh, approval of this rezoning. This is somehow being presented as though all of this is one project. Um, now, the necessity that I'm advocating for of saving this Mill Pond Park as it is as parkland, even though the city has not advocated, uh, allocated enough money to develop it yet as parkland, is that from there on down, there is the East River is joining the whole south of you know, um, Bronx waterfront area. And there is no public access 
anywhere. There's a huge area of land that is just allocated for trucks driving to a recycling center. This is just, it, I mean, it, it's criminal. Now, um, I learned early on about Plan New York the Bloomberg's plan to develop the waterfront. Well, you know what happened? It developed Manhattan, Queens, Brooklyn, and nothing has been developed for public access in the Bronx. Now, I'm all in favor of most of what these presentations have contained, except that another rezoning to change something that was a concession to the community allocated as parkland is really essentially inexcusable. Um, I'm sure uh, planning didn't, doesn't really realize what the South Bronx looks like. There is one little itty bitty area where there was once a pier that extended into the East River at the very end of 132nd Street. A not-for-profit is proposing to develop that that might happen in five years. But you know how large that is? It's about the size of this room. Thank you. Questions for Ms. Cunningham. Thank you for taking the time to come and um for your long record of advocacy now going back over the prior rezonings. Thank you. Oh. I sincerely hope that you consider turning down the rezoning aspect of this proposal. Our next speaker in opposition is Joyce Poggi. Poggi, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, I'll never forget that. <laughs> Good afternoon. I'm Joyce Hokey. I have lived in the South Bronx for over 40 years. There were a couple of issues that uh, were brought up during the presentation that you know, I just want to address before we uh, uh, I get started with my brief remarks, because they were more passion than anything else. Uh, my organization has already sent in its comments, BCEQ. I'm, I'm disappointed, sad really, that we are here in a city that is purported to have all these brilliant people working to make this a better city, a healthy city for all of its residents. But here we are with a proposal to take valuable parkland from a community that so desperately needs it. True, we need housing. But if we all, all we're doing is building housing and not balancing it with parks, we fail spectacularly. Now, I know the city can do better. I mean, all we need to do, and everybody can Google this, the Inwood NYC 2017 Action Plan. It exists. It's a model that can be replicated here. The Housing that's purported to be built here, first of all, the amount of people that they're planning to bring in to this housing is no way a sliver of open space, of parkland, can accommodate them. We want open space that's a destination. And the other day, I was just talking to a couple of the supervisors at Mill Pond Park because we are sponsoring the City of Water Day there this Saturday. Mm -hmm. And I said, what would you like to see on that spot over there? They said, well, we'd like to see the park expanded, and we'd like to see, a, a, what do you call it, the um, comfort stations. <laughs> I thought that was pretty awesome. Anyway, there were numerous listing sessions that we're having with the community. <clears throat> the city decided to go ahead with its own plans, even after hearing our concerns. This remaining unimproved parkland at Pier 5 
plus the decommissioned 150th Street and the last leg of Mill Pond Park along the inlet was a promise to create a park and a link to the greenway along the waterfront from McCombs Dam Bridge to 149th Street. The Parks Department had plans drawn up for a dock in the water over the Oak Point Link, a boathouse, and recreational facility for the community. A graduate class from MIT came down and worked with us and developed plans for this site. A coalition, the Harlem River Working Group, was formed to address this and bring attention to it. Ms. Hoagie, as I've given other speakers additional time, if I could ask you to wrap up in a minute. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. While waiting for the park funding, VCEQ, my organization, built a pop-up wetland on the site. And we were trying to address the water that comes down from the highway into the river. We were trying to clean it. We got a grant from the Parks Department, and we got a permit from the Parks Department to do that. And as the money ran out, the, of course, we couldn't continue, but it was an idea that we wanted to bring to this community because, first of all, there's no sanitation there at the present time. Everything that comes off the highway goes into the Harlem River, mm. and we're about cleaning mm. it and trying to get people to that river. So I'm going to wrap up real quick. I urge you to halt this project. Engage with the community to explore alternative sites and see how we can best meet the needs of all South Bronx residents. Because parks are important to our quality of life. We cannot, we don't have one, frankly. And you know, I can address the asthma, everybody knows about it, it exists, and nothing is being done to improve it. That's why we need parks. Thank you. Ms. Thank Hoagie. you. Question. Yes, Vice Chair Knuckles. Uh, Ms. Hoagie, what does a BCEQ stand Bronx for? Bronx Council for Environmental Quality. Quality. Thank you. <laughs> Commissioner Delos. Yes. Uh, Ms. Hoagie, thanks for being here. I'm just wondering, um, in the public, en I'm assuming that you participated in the public engagement process that that EDC had. Um, so can you maybe talk a little bit more about? how strong the sentiment was that, that there should be no redevelopment other than a park at the site? When I went to a meeting, a map was presented, color-coded, it was all laid out. That was done outside of the community. When I saw the Pier 5, it said housing. And I said, but this is a park. They said, no, that's housing. That's the public engagement. <coughs> And can you, can you maybe provide a little bit more history to those of us who may be, <clears throat> excuse me, less familiar about the, the extent of the promise um, about well, that becoming a parkland? The promise is if you go to the park and look at it, Mill Pond Park, and the maps mm -hmm. that are mounted there, it shows Pier 5 as a Mill Pond Park extension, future development. That's what it says. It's very clear. Other questions, Commissioner Ortiz. Hi, I mean, you raised a few issues for me, and I, you know, as I look over, sort of what the zoning text amendment will incorporate, and and, and this is also a question for for, you know, the applicants as well. Um, you know, I, I know that the streetscape uh, regulations that are outlined here speak to active frontage, transparency, access to parking. Um, but um, I'm curious whether uh, issues of sort of tree coverage or, you know, things that we incorporate in, say, quality housing, um, you know, can and should be in incorporated there. I don't know if that's the right place for them, but it's just a, an open question that I have that sort of reflects some of the comments you made. You know, can we ensure we've got things like tree coverage um, incorporated into our expectations right. that then get embedded um, in this, you know, if, we're, if they're not coming back to us, we want to make sure that, that some of that stuff is there. So I, I appreciate your comments. They sort of lead me along that path. Um, you know, and, and I think the same thing applies to, you know, uh, issues of uh, sustainability. 
um, you know, the, the degree to which um, we're incorporating a set of expectations around um, sustainability with respect to the buildings themselves and, and um, you know, there's just been so much press about uh, recently about the degree to which we're, we're facing uh, significant issues of, yeah. of global warming that are hard for us to treat on an individual basis, but, you know, a, a project like this, um, you know, just suggests that maybe there are opportunities um, to address some of your concerns. That area did flood during Sandy. It, it, it flooded. <laughs> I mean, it, had the tide been higher, it would have been worse, but it did, it did flood. And in developing a parkland, we, we're looking for a destination park. Uh, Mill Pond Park right now is just packed with people. The other parks in the area are just packed with people. The park's staff are just stressed trying to manage the number of people. So they said, expand our park. Give us a destination that these people can go to rather than pile on top of each other. Joyce Kilmer Park is supposed to be a passive park, but you have to constantly chase the people who want to barbecue and the kids who want to skate and the, the, all the boards, everything that should not be happening in those parks are happening there because they have nowhere else to go. Um, people leave the community to go to a Brooklyn Bridge Park to ride the carousel. <laughs> to you know, avail themselves of the services and the amenities out there. Why can we not have that in the Bronx? What's, what's wrong with the Bronx? I mean, to, to me, it's an awesome place. I've lived there over 40 years. We raised three kids there, great kids. What is wrong with the Bronx? Why are we always on the low end of the receiving line? That makes no sense to me. Any other questions for Ms. Hoagie? Thank you for taking the time to come and testify. Those are the end of the folks who have signed up to speak. Is there anyone else in the audience who might want to? Yes, sir. Please come up and introduce yourself. Good afternoon. Hi, my name is Michael Johnson. I Thank you for the opportunity to present or place comment on this particular project. I'm also a board member of the Bronx Council for Environmental Quality. I also serve on the advisory committee for the State Department of Environmental Conservation's Open Space Plan. And I'm a founding member of South Bronx Unite, which is an economic, social, and environmental justice advocacy coalition operating specifically out of Mine Haven and Port Morris in the South Bronx. And as it pertains to this space and this place that we're talking about, Mill Pond Park or Pier 5, it really runs deep, and I've heard some of the questions by, you know, the, the commission here around, you know, what type of advocacy or what type of engagement and people who came out to the public hearings and what kind of engagement, were there a lot of people there? We had, we packed both the, the various visioning sessions that were offered to the community and also public hearing opportunities when they came before the community board. People came with banners, people came with, with, with their children, all talking about how they need more access to green space and how important this plot of land was because it was promised, like Joyce Hoagie mentioned, that this was part of the Yankee Stadium deal, that we all thought this was going to be a refuge for our children to have more access to green space. Because what we know is, based on studies that have been done, that our community has the least quantity of green space per capita than anywhere else in the city. The Bronx has the largest green space because of our large parks of the north, but our community where our children, one in five, have asthma. Highest rates of obesity and diabetes. Studies being done by Congressman Serrano showing 15 years ago the cause is lack of recreational opportunities and green space to actually help filter the air. You know, so a space like this and so many others need to be created into green space. Because development doesn't only look like building housing. Development also looks like creating quality of life for the residents who live in our neighborhood where children don't have the access to other communities, where our children breathe different quality of air than other children to the south and to the west of us, which is an injustice. 
It's an environmental injustice, it's an environmental racism, and it should not exist. And I, I'm sorry it falls on you all's plate and your desk to really talk about trying to decide on a rezoning or not based on quality of life for the children in our community. But this has a, a direct effect to it. All the things that Mr. Brady spoke about, about the development happening on our peninsula, it's an explosion happening in Mount Haven like nowhere else in the city. Our coalition has, has denoted about 22 developments, 80% of which are market rate, happening around our peninsula. And that's probably only 70% of what is actually going on there. So when you're talking about adding 10 to 15,000 residents in the next five to 10 years, what does it look like? The infrastructure's not being improved. The train system doesn't look like it's changing any. And if you do not add green space, how do we make it a healthier scenario than we already have? Are we gonna build on top of what's already a, a really de degrading situation for the health of our community? So I think you all do have a responsibility, like I do, staying up here as a father and as a resident of this community, to say something different must occur and how can we create different outcomes instead of creating the, doing the same thing and expecting different results. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Questions? Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else in the audience? Okay. Um, the record on this matter is going to remain open for 10 days to receive comments on the DEIS, and that is through Monday, the 24th of July. And with that, this hearing is closed. And Madam Secretary, is there any other business before the Commission? No, Madam Chair. So at 12.47, the meeting is adjourned. <laughs>